We then turn to item two, questions, and I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas South, Mrs Christian, to ask question one. Good morning, Mr President. Um, I'd like to ask the Chief Minister whether his government supports World Menopause Day and if he will make a statement. I call on Arch of Aishot, Chief Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Honourable Member for raising this topic in this chamber today. This is a matter which, until recently perhaps, has not been as important in the public consciousness as it should be. This government, of course, supports World Menopause Day, which coincidentally is today. It is very important that we have open and frank conversations about the menopause, both at home and in the workplace. There is no shame or embarrassment about talking about any matters associated with women's health. Government is offering dedicated training for all its managers to help promote key information and training support around the menopause. The first of these training courses is scheduled to begin next week. There are also two menopause awareness sessions organised by the Healthy and Well Group taking place this week. Manx Care and Public Health are working jointly to promote wider messaging to the public to raise awareness around World Menopause Day. Today at Nobles Hospital there is an information stand in the main foyer discussing the menopause and offering advice and support. Posters are going up around the hospital, supported by social media posts, throughout the whole of October to help encourage conversations about the menopause and perimenopause in the workplace. Public Health will also be running awareness campaigns on social media regarding Menopause Awareness Month, encouraging open conversations about the menopause and detailing where essential resources and support can be found. Mr President, whilst today is World Menopause Day, it is vital that these open and frank conversations about this inevitable life event for at least 50% of our population continue. It is important that we give the best possible support, both at home and work, to anybody experiencing the perimenopause, menopause or who are postmenopausal. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to thank the Chief Minister for his positive statement. Um, Could the Chief Minister confirm if the dedicated training and the menopause menopause awareness working groups, the awareness campaigns, um, will they be covering um, uh, areas such as public transport, police, fire services, um, education providers in the public sector? And does he agree with me that the importance of educating these areas, the civil service and the private sector, could minimise the gender pay gap and that maintaining the female workforce is crucial for a diverse and inclusive workforce? Thank you, Mr President. Chief Minister to reply. Uh, I'm sure, Mr President, that all those involved will try and extend the reach uh, of their uh, education campaigns um, to encourage people to discuss this matter and to educate people about this matter as widely as possible. Um, and I will certainly be encouraging that to be the case uh, in terms of uh, the awareness that, that we've already made and the groups that are already engaging uh, across the, uh, across the uh, civil and public sector in terms of civil service and public sector in terms of increasing awareness about the uh, menopause and indeed dealing with uh, the relevant impacts. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Does the Chief Minister agree with me that by promoting and supporting world menopause today, um, we'll show the island as a leader of the menopause pride and could reduce the taboo around the subject and help develop initiatives to drive future policy making? Thank you, Mr President. Chief Minister to reply. I'm sure that, uh, as the Honourable uh, Questioner has uh, already uh, acknowledged, I hope that uh, the statement today was a a positive one in support of World Menopause Day, an acknowledgement um, of the issues uh, of, of the menopause, and uh, I'm sure there's more work to be done in terms of uh, moving this, uh, this, this area forward. Final supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. I wonder if the Chief Minister might today um, commit to ensuring his government review the all-party parliamentary group report submitted to the UK Government last week to see if any of their recommendations could be adopted here on the Isle of Man. Thank you, Mr President. Chief Minister to reply. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, ask for that to be done, Mr President. We move on to question two. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas South, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister of Treasury whether Treasury has considered reviewing the maximum value for the general benefit in kind exemption. I call on Shavesha Katashi, Treasury Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for her very apt question, given the current cost of living increases. 
employers who are considering a response to the current inflationary pressures can, within the existing scope of the benefit and kind legislation, provide employees with vouchers which are redeemable for consumables without being subject to income tax and national insurance contributions. The vouchers must not be exchangeable for cash or considered to be readily, readily convertible assets. The current benefit and kind exemption limit is £600 per employee per employer. This incorporates all benefits provided by the employer in any one tax year. Some employers already utilise the £600 exemption for luncheon vouchers, shopping vouchers and other benefits. The benefit and kind exemption does not apply to employers paying employees' personal expenses directly, such as energy bills or one-off cash payments. This is considered remuneration and will be subject to income tax and national insurance <coughs> contributions. I'd like to reassure the Honourable Member and all, all members of this Court that benefits in kind are considered annually as part of the Budget, together with all tax, tax measures, and this year will be no different. As a result, as, as benefits in kind and exemption is tax year based, any changes, whether they are made now or in February at the Budget, would not take effect until the 2023-24 tax year. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, could the Minister confirm if the benefit and kind exemption voucher option um, could be redeemed for energy supply if energy suppliers were offering vouchers? Um, and if not, has the Treasury Department considered this as a, as a change to the policy? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to thank the Honourable um, Member for her question. They would be exchangeable for energy vouchers. I understand that some energy providers do provide these vouchers, but I've also contacted the Bank Utilities Authority to see if this is a facility they would be willing to offer. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs. Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. That's, that's exceptionally good news. Um, the temporary cost of living payments provided by employers are subject to tax and, and national insurance contributions, as you said, um, whereas the benefit in kind are not subject to tax and national insurance. With inflation levels nearly at 10%, why has the maximum level not been raised to help employers help their employees with the rising cost of living? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I've previously described, this is a tax concession and so any changes would be part of the budget process because they cover the overall tax year. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. <clears throat> One of the benefits of the Love Alaman card is its capacity to be used in this area. Is that happening? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the use of the benefits in, in, in kind concession is not something that Treasury monitors because it's a, a, the, it gives the ability for employers to give um, various vouchers. So I'm not aware of the exact nature of the use of the Love Isle Man card. I do know that one of the reasons it was brought in originally was that certain corporate providers wanted the ability to give a, a voucher that could be used for, to support local businesses during a period of economic slowdown. And hopefully that will be promoted again this winter. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, um, Mr President. Um, is it within the Minister's gift to actually bring forward a, a budget initiative within the year, not just waiting for the budget in February? Um, and many employers have announced sums of up to double um, uh, the, the £600. And I know some are even triple the value of the benefit and kind exemption. Surely it's an incentive for this government to raise this value sooner so that not only Manx residents, employees will be better off, but also more likely that the vouchers are spent in the Manx economy. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. If I can um, just, just explain that the benefit and kind exemption has been increased gradually from um, 1998 to 99, from £100 to £400, then from 2018 to 2019, from £400 to £600. But this is a tax concession which looks at the overall benefits given to employ employees by employers over the tax year. And so I'm not at liberty to change it halfway through that tax year. Thank you. Move on to question three. I'm going to call on the Honourable Member for Douglas South, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Um, what assess I'd like to ask the Minister for Treasury what assessment has been made to the cost of the taxpayer of a payment equivalent to the community cost bonus payable in Jersey. Thank you, Mr President. Colin Shabay, Treasury Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The community cost bonus payable in Jersey is an annual payment to help households that are just above the level at which income support would be payable with the cost of goods and services tax on food on that island. 
In 2022, it was set at the rate of £258.25 pence per household, available to households that do not get income support, do not pay income tax, and include at least one member who has been resident in Jersey for at least five years. It's administered by the Department of Customer and Local Services, the department that processes benefit payments. Residents have to make an online application in October each year. The Income Tax Department then provide bulk tax data to the other department in order that they can, can assess if they meet the household tax criteria. Given the current cost of living, the community cost bonus for 2022 has been increased to £516.50 pence, and the qualifying criteria extended to households that one, have not received income support in the seven days prior to, to their application being made, two, have a household tax liability of less than £2,735 for the year tax year ending 2021, and three, include at least one member who has been an ordinary resident in Jersey for at least five years. Mr President, it is important to note that the community cost bonus in Jersey is not a payment designed specifically to respond to increases in the cost of living. It is a well-established scheme that has been adapted to broaden its coverage. Therefore, the Government of Jersey already have systems and resources in place to process and assess applications and make the payments. If the Isle of Man were to develop something similar, a new scheme would have to be developed, drafted and approved by Timwald, processing and assessment systems developed, and therefore significant resources allocated. In answer to the Honourable Member's question, it is impossible to determine how many people would qualify for this payment on the Isle of Man using the same criteria. A local scheme would have to be available to single households with a total income of less than £31,420 and two-person households with an income of less than £49,125. A payment made in the 2022-23 year would be based on income in the 2020-21 tax year as assessments for the 21-22 year have not been completed for all residents. Most individuals in the Isle of Man are taxed as individuals, and so the Income Tax Division does not hold data on households or relationships between two separately taxed individuals living in the same household in order to establish if they are in a household as defined for these purposes. By virtue of the payment not being available to people on income support, the Social Security Division will also not hold data on such households, as household data is not required to be declared for non-income related capacity benefits. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Um, surely it would be possible to come up with an estimate of what such a scheme might cost. Has any attempt to be made to do so? Um, if so, what is the estimated cost? And, uh, I'm really concerned that the Minister has just mentioned something to do with resources. Is, is he also concerned with the resources in his department currently at the cost of living crisis? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, again, the, the community cost bonus was established in Jersey in 2008, um, and so it's been running for some time. In answer to her specific questions, we ha Treasury have been looking at people on or below the median um, a wage and how they might be targeted and that work is ongoing. In terms of the resources available to both the tax office, the benefits office and the rate section, that, that is finite and, and as, as you will know, um, we are working at the moment to make sure that we have a computerised system, particularly for the benefits section, that is fit for purpose and can, re and can respond to some of the sudden changes in the cost of living that we've experienced over the last nine months. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, uh, Mr President. The schemes that the Isle of Man has in place are all geared towards those on benefits. While I fully endorse these schemes, there are many people who are vulnerable and need support of who are not on benefits as their expenditure is exceeding their income. So are we wrong to say we're supporting the most vulnerable minister as many of the most vulnerable are not currently supported by these schemes? Can the Minister please expand on what specific support is being considered for those vulnerable people not currently el eligible to support? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Honourable Member for, for her question. I think she's quite right. 
as many people have commented in this honourable court and in another place, as we've seen the general inflationary pressures continue and worsen over the last nine months, we've seen more and more people affected to very varying degrees. And I think every individual and every individual family has been affected in their own specific way. The role of this government was quite clearly set out at the start of the invasion of the Ukraine that we would not be able to help everyone, but would do as much as possible to target that support at those who would, who would deemed most vulnerable and people on benefits, people on low income and families were quite easily identifiable and it was quite easy um, using the existing techniques and resources we have to target benefits to them. As the um, problems with the cost of living have increased and been more prolonged, government have stepped in as was was outlined to this Honourable Court only last month to provide universal benefits such as the freeze on electricity prices and also the cap on bus fares. And that work to, do, to actually address the increased cost of living for the inhabitants of our island is ongoing and will continue to develop as we head into the winter. Thank you, Mr President. We move on to question four. Call on the Honourable Member for Garth. Mrs Kane. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. President. I hope you can hear me. I'm having some problems hearing the Chamber this morning. Uh, my question is to ask the Treasury Minister whether he has any plans to review the National Insurance Holiday Scheme. Call on Chavesh Akhtashki, Treasury Minister, to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. If I can reassure the Honourable Member that I think we can hear her, and I just hope that um, she can hear, hear us. Mr. President, the National Insurance Holiday Scheme was introduced in April 2019 to encourage people to come to the island and take up work on a permanent basis and help ensure that the island's economy will continue to flourish. The scheme also took account of the need to make sure that the island provides an attractive working environment that encourages students to come back here once they have completed their studies elsewhere. Since its introduction, the scheme is reviewed annually as part of the budget process and any amendments brought forward accordingly. I would like to draw the Honourable Member's attention to two recent written questions on the scheme, one from Mr Speaker in April of this year and the other at the end of September from our Honourable Friend Mr Morehouse. Both of these answers illustrate the ongoing analysis of the scheme. The scheme was introduced in April 2019 with the first application submitted in April 2020. Given that there has just been over two years of applications, I think it's too early for a full audit of the scheme. This would best be undertaken at least five year, when f at least five years have passed, and the long-term success or otherwise of the scheme can be determined. Thank you. Did you have a supplementary, Mrs. Kane? Yes, please, Mr. President. Please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. It indicates that amongst 157 applications from graduates, a number of five of them have been unsuccessful. And my question is, although this is for a variety of reasons, when it is um, graduates that we are trying to attract back to the island, um, is he reviewing the reasons why those um, applications were not permitted? Does he understand that this is disenfranchised time, particularly the students who are the very target of the scheme? Um, and when people have completed the full 12 months, they feel that they should be entitled to the amount. Is there any possibility that providing those people stay on the island, that they could be entitled to receive the national insurance um, rebate? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I hope the Honourable Court will understand that I'm not able to detail individual claims um, for, for a national insurance um, holiday. As the Honourable Member says, a very small number have been um, turned down. The application form is relatively straightforward and, sh and pinpoints that these must be permanent positions, and the number who have not been successful is very low. However, the Treasury Department will continue to review this scheme ongoing, and the National Insurance Holiday Scheme is only one of a whole series of benefits that is offered by various government departments and by various private companies on the island to entice Isle of Man students, once they've graduated, back to work on our island. Thank you. Supplementary, Lauder. 
Uh, good morning, Director. And given the ongoing state of the finances of the public sector pension fund, the National Insurance Fund, um, whether he's considered um, the prospect of making sure that those who are receiving the benefits of a national insurance holiday um, do not incur or are not eligible to accrue a state pension um, credit for the year, so make sure that the, uh, you're only getting what you pay for if you choose to pay for it. Minister to reply. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Again, we are trying to entice people back to our island. This is a payment made on completion of 12, year, of 12 months of work on, on the island. And so once people have dedicated their, their, their lives to come back and work here, I think it's absolutely right that they become part of the system and can draw down on things like pension credits in the future. Thank you. Honourable members, we'll move on to question five. And I call on the honourable member for Douglas South, Mrs Christian. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister for Enterprise what opportunities the Department for Enterprise is investigating as a result of the fall in the value of the pound against the US dollar. Minister for Enterprise to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. The Department for Enterprise works closely with individual businesses through the executive agencies and their business development managers to understand the opportunities and risks businesses are facing. It's important to note that currency fluctuations are not always an opportunity. Uncertainty in markets are a significant threat and can lead to financial loss. Most businesses that work in international markets will be aware and experienced to hedge against and adjust to those scenarios, not only to reduce their potential losses, but also to seek opportunities. The initiatives and the schemes the department seeks to deliver to support individual businesses and sectors tend to be of a longer term nature. Where businesses recognise or have a desire to explore new opportunities, the Department for Enterprise will work closely with the business to understand where government can best support. And the department operates a number of enterprise support schemes that can be used to support the engagement of a consultant to advise and support businesses on exploring new markets and exploiting opportunities. In addition, there is of course the added attraction the island and the United Kingdom may have to international travellers through a weaker pound. But again, this will very much depend on the medium and longer term position rather than short term fluctuations. If the Honourable Member, or indeed any other Honourable Members, believe there are opportunities in this space, or even on any topic, I would always welcome such input either directly or to the relevant agency. But to date, I am not aware of any significant opportunities that businesses have flagged to the Department as a result of recent short-term fluctuations in the value of sterling. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. It's, it, it's obviously well, probably I've better well known that I've seen, but um, is the Department aware of the capitalising of on interest from US film production companies in producing TV and movies in Britain now that it's a bargain location. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As I said, I'm not aware of any opportunities that have been flagged to the department by any local businesses as a result of recent short-term fluctuations in the value of sterling. Uh, I'm hesitant to describe the Isle of Man or the United Kingdom as a bargain jurisdiction as a result of recent short-term fluctuations in the value of the currency. Yeah. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, has any assessment been made of the potential risks to island companies being purchased by opportunistic, opportunistic um, operators from overseas and the potential impacts of this on employment and future investment on Ireland. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. That question is so far outside the scope of the original question, I don't feel able to provide a sensible answer at this time. <clears throat> Supplementary, Mr. Christ uh, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. And the UK has benefited from over £5 billion investment in big budget TV and movies in the past year. I'm not sure how the Minister is not really aware of this. Um, and the pound to dollar slump will create further opportunity. Does the Department plan to target achieving some of this investment in the Isle of Man, as there would be, some mul would be multiple benefits to our economy? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, that question is about film investment in the United Kingdom. Uh, the question we're dealing with here is potential opportunities for Isle of Man businesses as a result of the fall in the value of the pound against the dollar. I would reiterate, Mr. President, a short-term currency fluctuation does not necessarily represent any significant opportunity for the island. However, if this is a longer-term change in trend between uh, the value of the uh, pound against the US dollar or other currencies, there may very well be opportunities out there, which I would encourage local businesses to explore. Uh, and the Department Department will be there to support those local businesses should they choose to explore any of these potential opportunities. Supplementary, Mrs. Christian. Thank 
you, Mr. President. Could the Minister confirm if DfE have engaged with any conversations with the British Film Commission, the Agency for Attractive Film and TV Production to the UK, to the Isle of Man? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Once again, this question is about the, res the resultant value of the fall in the pound against the US dollar. It is not about film. I have no information to hand uh, in relation to film. And if the Honourable Member wants to ask questions about film, that probably should be the question she's tabled. It's about Move to question six. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbery Castamalu. Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for Enterprise how many Love Alaman cards have been sold, what the value of those cards is and how much has been invested in the cards, both financially and in terms of officer time. Thank you. Minister for Enterprise to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. The Love Isle of Man gift card is an economic recovery group project which the Department for Enterprise was tasked to develop in order to encourage on-island spend in support of the Manx economy. I have circulated a copy of up-to-date statistics to Timwell members that confirms around 2,500 individual Love Isle of Man gift cards have been sold to individuals and corporate businesses. The approximate £14,000 of government-backed incentives has generated over £100,000 of consumer funds on the cards, with over £70,000 spent at local hospitality businesses to date. From the launch of the project to date, just over £240,000 has been spent on the initiative, which includes front-loaded costs of £200,000 to build the platform <coughs> itself ongoing administration services and government-backed incentives of £14,000. These costs have been further broken down in the, in the statistics that have already been circulated. Currently, the Department for Enterprise's marketing team has taken on responsibility for marketing the Love Isle of Man gift card as part of their business-as-usual work, which has not added to any headcount. As a result, this has reduced the ongoing operational costs with the appointed supplier. A business development manager is also in place to manage this project and the relationship with the appointed external supplier, which accounts for roughly half of their workload. Going forward, the Department is planning to release data at regular intervals on the number of Love Isle of Man gift cards sold, the total value loaded onto these cards, and the remaining balances to provide greater transparency on this initiative. This information will be published as open data on the Government website. As we head into the winter period, the Department will be looking to use the Love Isle of Man gift card to encourage individuals and corporates to give these cards as a gift this Christmas, to help keep spend on Ireland and support the hospitality sector as we enter into a traditionally slow time for this sector. Supplementary Lauder. Oh, good morning, Dr. Train. Um, with 72,000 um, being spent on the cards that may well have been spent anyway, and 240,000 pounds incurred in costs, would the minister agree that this is a three-to-one cost-benefit um, ratio in completely the wrong direction, and that so far this scheme has been a complete failure in terms of value for money? Minister, to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, no, I wouldn't actually. Um, would. Good luck with this one. Of course, he would. A significant number of the cards that were purchased were purchased by corporates uh, for their staff. This is money that would ordinarily have gone on Amazon vouchers or other uh, international uh, suppliers. So that money isn't money that would have been spent anyway on the Isle of Man. This is money that is being redirected into the local economy by this initiative. It's also worth remembering that uh, this first round of uh, incentive and spend was very much that. It was the first round of incentive. And I would agree with the Honourable uh, Member, if the service were to stop there, it would represent a significant investment for a minimal return. However, if the, if the card is used for multiple rounds of incentives, and each one of those rounds can generate £100,000 of consumer funds or £14,000 of investment, the setup costs will then pale in comparison for the benefits to the local economy. So, no, Mr. President, I would disagree with the, uh, with the assertions that have been made by Mr. Speaker. I think this uh, Love Isle of Man gift card initiative does have potential value. <coughs> it will depend on how we maximise that value into the future. I mentioned Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Given the challenges in terms of returns outlined there, is the Minister happy with this as a concept going forward? He's new to the Department, which is reviewing key areas. Is this one he wants to take forward? <coughs> Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I think yes. I think I am satisfied with this as a concept. I think the idea of an Isle of Man branded local card or local support that will encourage people to spend uh, locally uh, is of benefit. Uh, I think you heard the Treasury Minister earlier talking about benefits in kind exemptions that can be applied to vouchers. There may be some potential here uh, as well for crossover uh, as we go into the winter. I think the, the card and the initiative does have a lot of potential, but like I've just uh, said in response to the previous question, it will depend on how we choose to utilise it going forwards. Supplementary, Lorda. 
Uh, Comrade, um, the Minister said that they will be publishing ongoing data about this. Will they also commit to publishing the estimated exchequer benefit to this so that uh, we can see just what return to, to government they will be on the outlay? Um, he says that this is a project that is going to on go, uh, go on for some time. Just how long does he plan on throwing good money after bad on this particular project? Minister to reply. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think I've already dealt with the good money after bad. Mr. Speaker has uh, singularly failed, I think, to understand the uh, potential benefits here. Uh, but I think that the question around can we publish the exchequer benefit is a good one. Uh, I think uh, we will investigate that, and if it's possible, we'll also be sharing that information again as part of that open data set that will be available online. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you. Um, with regard to the unused balances, if they remain unused at the end of the card's life, do they return to government or go to some other group? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I will find out uh, and I will circulate the information. Supplementary, Mrs. Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the, the Minister mentioned a significant proportion or significant amount was bought by corporates. Could he just clarify how much that was? And also, uh, obviously, <clears throat> he mentioned progress being made towards encouraging wider use. But when are we going to see that happen? Um, how long does he estimate that it possibly it could be extended out to other areas of the economy, not just hospitality, if that's the way forward for the Love Island Man card? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President. I don't have the exact number, uh, the exact value, sorry, uh, from those corporate cards. I'll see if I can find out and get that information circulated as well. Um, I don't have timescales on any uh, future plans. Uh, those don't sit with the department. Uh, future plans, uh, as during COVID, sat with the Economic Recovery Group. Now they will sit with the Economic Strategy Board. Uh, that will be a decision for, uh, to be made uh, in the future. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Guramaya Dekteran, uh, could the Minister just confirm how he's going to increase awareness of the, uh, the actual scheme and the card? It seems to be a little bit under the radar still. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, that's a really good question. Uh, I think if uh, ESB does decide to uh, roll anything out over the winter, there'll have to be marketing and communications around that to raise awareness. Also, to see if we can get more suppliers on board, more co companies to accept the card. Uh, I think, again, that'll have to be a decision that's taken by ESB in terms of where do we see the future of this going. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Treasury Minister suggested that there may be a winter campaign for the COD, would that involve more government spend or is that something that the Minister is reluctant to look at? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, it's not something I can commit to, if that's what the member is looking for. Um, but I think, as we saw with the first time around, there was an incentive-based uh, solution which did involve government uh, putting some cash on it in two different ways and it may be that that's something that's considered in future. Again, that will be a decision for ESB to make, but personally, I'm reasonably comfortable to say we should be exploring all options as we look to how we support local businesses and support people over the winter. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Could the Minister actually confirm if any conversations have, had, um, have happened with other sectors prior to today um, with widening out to the Love Isle of Mancard? And if that's the case, when and how long ago did those conversations happen? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I can't answer that question, having only been in post for a few weeks, but I can certainly find out uh, what conversations are being had uh, about potentially extending the remit of the card. Again, though, that will be a decision for ESB in terms of does government want to continue utilising this? Do we want to uh, expand it out? Do we want to run something over the winter, or do we want to keep things the way they are? Final supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the Minister is new to the Department, so he might not know um, this. But can I ask the Minister um, what conversations have already taken place with suppliers to try and get them to take up the card? I believe currently it's about 60 suppliers, I think, that um, accept the Love Isle of Man card. Um, and would the Minister agree with me that if you can get more suppliers on board and more people that will accept it, that will then make the card much more of an attractive proposition to the general public? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think it's a bit chicken and egg. 
I think if you have more suppliers, it's a more attractive card for companies to buy for their staff, and it's a more attractive card for people to buy uh, themselves. Equally, if you have more people buying the card, it's more attractive then to local retailers and, uh, and uh, hospitality businesses to take the card on. Uh, I think the member is right. It is around 60 at the moment. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, the more information we get out there about the amount of money that has come onto these cards and that has been spent locally, so that's the £70,000 that's been redeemed to date and the £30,000 that is still sat waiting on the card to be spent, uh, I think that should hopefully encourage more local businesses to sign up, uh, but it's a very good point well made. Move on to question seven. A call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castamaloo, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask the Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture what plans are in place to ensure security of supply of bread and other imported foods. Thank you. Colin Shavesha, Kamal Tagbi, as Ennis, Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture. Thank you, Mr President. The importation of food and other daily household and business essentials is a critical infrastructure challenge for our island nation, which is principally and reliably serviced by the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. From its daily service to and from the UK, these cargoes are expertly managed by a further range of local logistics companies, providing management to and from UK distribution and marshalling depots to local door-to-door -door deliveries. With this in mind, I'm encouraged by the news that the Steam Packet have recently purchased the MV Arrow, a roll-on, roll-off cargo vessel which has served the island very well over the last few years, particularly in the busy summer period, and which now further strengthens our resilience for daily supplies, a resilience which, as we know, can be frequently tested throughout the winter months. Our retailers and food service businesses rely heavily on these import services, but are also experts in dealing with their own stock and supply chains for their own business success. Many also champion and stock a good range of local produce, which covers many of our staple foods from bread, meat, dairy, vegetables, eggs, flour, seafood, and a whole range of drinks. Whilst the bakery sector is now smaller than we have enjoyed over the years, it does still have an important part to play in supporting the island with daily fresh bread and using as much local flour as possible. My department is currently working with both production scale bakeries on diversification and investment plans to increase their output to fill some of this market share. Many of our local products are pitched at competitive prices, but importantly, avoid unnecessary air miles and assist with reducing our carbon footprint while supporting island businesses. Whilst I recognise that the cost of living is increasing rapidly, I would urge everyone to try to put at least one locally grown or produced product in their basket when they go shopping. These small considerations can have a big cumulative community effect. The more demand there is for local produce, the more we will produce, which naturally increases our resilience against disruption on imported products. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. When Ramsey Bakery closed, there was a suggestion that an alternative supplier was considering entering the mass production market. Was it the case that the government was unable to financially support the business proposals? Thank you, Mr President. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. <laughs> My department, as I said, is currently working with both production scale bakeries on diversification and investment plans to increase their output to try and fill some of the market share that has been left by the closure of Ramsey Bakery. There have been no formal requests for financial support, but as I, as I confirm, government have talked through options with both businesses and remain available to do so. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. Um, given there is now no mass bread manufacturer on Ireland, and bread arriving on the island is often three days old, has any consideration been given to this? Should residents be advised about the risk during the winter period ahead? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you. As I spoke of in my original answer, the purchase of the MV Arrow should reduce incidences wherein we cannot bring supplies to the island. Uh, we do expect to have good logistical resilience, and we also know that many of our stores do keep supplies um, of, of bread, sometimes even um, frozen bread, that certainly allows us to provide um, for our schools and prisons in a, in a situation where bread doesn't arrive on Ireland. Um, however, I think, as with many people who, who didn't buy Ramsey Bakery bread, because that wasn't the entire island, there are also options where people can keep some bread in their freezer, should that be something that they're personally concerned about, but I would assure people that on the whole we are very fortunate to have bread on our shelves in the vast majority of days of the year and on a very small number of occasions we know that that supply sometimes is reduced. We do also have our local bakeries which as I said before I would really encourage people to support wherever they can. Supplementary, Mr Johnson. Thank you Mr President. I may ask the Minister uh, what engagement has her department had with farmers and other stakeholders to ensure their input into the ongoing work on the food security strategy. Minister to reply. 
Thank you. So initially, we, we started up with the silver group. That ha allowed for some conversation, although I do acknowledge that there was feedback that that hadn't been uh, as successful as I had hoped. Um, we, I have an ongoing meeting, regular meeting with the Manx National Farmers Union, as well as going out to meet with um, other uh, farmers on the island. I have a very much an open door policy on wanting to talk and understand both from farmers, our fish producers and our other um, producers and food businesses on the, uh, on the island. Um, so it's very much at the minute at the uh, conversational stage. We have a uh, current piece of work that's ongoing looking at food security and agriculture strategies, do preparation work exploring um, the current situation here and that of our neighbouring jurisdictions to ensure that when I bring a piece of work around food security and agriculture uh, strategy that will provide for our future strategic position to this honourable court, it is absolutely future-proofed and does acknowledge those voices that m absolutely must be heard. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just taking that a little further, when did the Council of Ministers last discuss food security and the availability of basic foodstuffs on Ireland in the event that access is limited due to bad weather or other factors? Thank you. Minister to reply. The Council of Ministers have discussed food security and availability in relation uh, to closure of Ramsey Bakery, the war in Ukraine, and more recently the cost of living crisis, and that has been a regular item um, on our uh, agenda. I haven't got the exact date that we last discussed, but it's certainly been something that's come up in other conversations also. Um, we're currently, as I said, reviewing the food security strategy and the agriculture strategy and how they interact relative to global supply chain pressures um, and current political and economic uh, issues. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, in recent sort of contact I have had with stakeholders in the industry, um, and as the Minister alludes to, there's discussions going on at the moment about agricultural strategy and food security strategy. I get the impression there's been very little engagement recently with, with, with the farming industry in some of these crucial issues when it comes to food security and, and agricultural strategy. And I would hope very much that they are they're a key part of that and that the Minister would, will soon be re-engaging with them to ensure they are, they are very much part of this. Um, because obviously it, that is absolutely crucial for, for an industry that is, that is really struggling at the moment and, and needs that... Uh, clear direction and commitment from, from government. Minister to reply. Thank you, and I'd certainly take that, that feedback on board, um, and I'm grateful for the Honourable Member for providing it. Um, we are at the data capture um, point at the minute. We're trying to gather those thoughts. We have made some changes to the agri-environment scheme off the back of some of that feedback to try and provide support um, to farmers, um, acknowledging that the cost of energy, imported feed, fertiliser, packaging, logistics, equipment, <coughs> and staff have gone up, and we really do see uh, the pressure that's had. So there have been some changes. We've had positive feedback um, from those, um, but I do acknowledge absolutely that it's vital um, that our farmers are very much and will be when we start to put the strategy uh, together from the feedback we've had so far. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Guru Heidek, um, would the Minister agree that the two remaining uh, suppliers of bread on the island are in no way going to be able to replace what Ramsey Bakery was going to be doing? Because uh, I've spoken with Ross Bakery, for example, and there was a reluctance actually at first to to scale up their operation, they were at a comfortable level of where they are. So we're not going to replace the output of Ramsey Bakery realistically. Minister to reply. So it's absolutely the case that at the minute we don't have the capacity to produce all bread types uh, demand for the island. Um, but as I said, we are working with them to look at where they can uh, increase their, their output. And that's very much not us asking or forcing them to do that. That's in line with what they would like to do and how DEFA can support them through the grant schemes and through the advice and support that we have available to us. But we're certainly not forcing any businesses to do anything that they don't wish to do. Thank you. On to question eight, and I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. I beg to ask the Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture what plans there are to update legislation to allow environmental health to take action where motion lights cause a nuisance and if she will make a statement. Colin Shavesha, Comal Tagby, Azinis, Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture. Thank you, Mr President. The Department's environment, Environmental Health Officers currently have powers to investigate matters listed as statutory nuisances in Part 1 of the Public Health Act 1990. 
When the Act was first introduced, this list largely mirrored the equivalent provisions set out in Part 3 of the UK's Environmental Protection Act 1990. However, over the last 32 years, the UK Parliament has approved the addition of further categories, and the UK list now includes fumes or gases, for example, odours from domestic premises, artificial light, for example, obtrusive light from floodlights, and insects emanating from relevant industrial, trade or business premises, for example, flies associated with sewage treatment works or landfills. The Department occasionally receives complaints from members of the public about smells from domestic premises and obtrusive light from security lights, but without the appropriate categories of statutory nuisance, it is powerless currently to do anything. At present, an amendment bill of other or, of other, or other suitable legislative vehicle would be required each and every time the Department wanted to add a new category of statutory nuisance to the list. In isolation, such a bill would not be a priority within the Department's legislative programme due to other more pressing matters. However, and I did mention to the Honourable Member that perhaps he was listening in to DEFA, uh, <laughs> um, I am, however, pleased to announce that the Public Health Directorate of the Cabinet Office have offered to include amendments to the Public Health Act 1990 in a new Public Health Functions Bill that would allow my Department to alter to the list of statutory nuisances through secondary legislation subject to public consultation and Timwood approval and this is an action we have recently approved taking within DEFA. I can therefore confirm our intent would be to include nuisance from motion lights in such secondary legislation. Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, can I assure the humble uh, minister that, as far as I'm aware, deaf meetings aren't being bugged. Uh, <laughs> it was just it was just a coincidence of timing um, in the question being laid down. Can I ask the minister? Um, it's very welcome what's been said, and I'm glad that it's going to be um, it's going to be tackled, and the secondary um, legislation and regulations make sense. <laughs> can I ask whether, uh, the minister? Is there any idea when this public health functions bill is likely to come forward, um, and any timescales on that? Minister to reply. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, have the date for the public health um, bill coming through because it doesn't sit within our department, but we would be putting the secondary regulations off the back of it. So ours will simply be an amendment to allow us to change all those by secondary regulation. Supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I also ask the Minister, would it be the intention um, that as the Bill is progressing through, those regulations would be drafted in unison, so that once the Bill comes into force, the regulations will actually be drafted and ready to be brought to this Honourable Court? Minister to reply. Yeah, that is our intention, and the Bill is going to be early next year, I'm now able to confirm. Um, so our intention would be to be putting that together in parallel. Our, our officers have already identified those areas um, in which they feel uh, we, we should be adding in. We are comfortable that there are areas we know we've had complaints about, and it's absolutely right um, that we seek to make those changes. Move on to uh, question nine. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. I beg to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care what progress has been made in bringing forward changes to prescription charges and if you will make a statement. Minister for Health and Social Care. Um, thank you, Mr President. Can I thank the Honourable Member for his question this morning? In the, Isle of, in the Isle of Man, prescription charges are currently applied for NHS prescriptions unless the patient qualifies under an exemption. The charges are presented as a fixed fee, and for those drugs, the cost is currently £3.85 per item. This fee has remained unchanged since 2004, despite the costs of drugs rising year on year and the impact of COVID-19 and Brexit also having increased these costs significantly. On average, the cost per item to our health service is now just under £10 <coughs> per item. Prescription charge reviews are very complex, as the previous minister, health minister outlined in an oral question in the other place in February 2021. The principles behind the exemption are wide-reaching and cut right across areas of social policy and medical need. Many patients fall into a number of exemption categories, which makes it more difficult to understand the impact that any changes to an exemption category would have. Almost every amendment debate for the National Health Services Dr um, Changes for Drugs and Appliances Regulation 2004 over the last 18 years have featured a, recurring, a recurring theme of options, abolishing fees, raising fees, reducing exemptions, widening exemptions. 
and each time the complexity of the issue has overwhelmed the debate and the ability to find an equitable and sustainable solution. Prescription charges or fees were last reviewed in 2017 when they were included in the broader consultation on the National Health and Care Service General Scheme and Charter and the proposals from the Department in April 2018 to increase prescription charges were not taken forward. A general review was carried out by the Department during spring 2022 and it has further highlighted the complexities we are facing. The Department has agreed to introduce a phased approach to reviewing and implementing changes to how we collect pre prescription charges. Phase one, in August, we started a campaign to promote the use of prepayment certificates. Prepayment certificates cap the level of fees payable for the duration of the certificate. Phase two, in August, we also started to look at whether we can introduce a more affordable way of paying for prepayment certificates through the use of a direct debit system. We're hoping to make a decision how best to do this by the end of the financial year. And phase three, we will review the fairness of exemptions and look at the level of fees are set at. The Department is committed to ensuring the medical needs of patients are met in a fair and an equitable, and an equitable way, <laughs> at the same time balancing our commitments to, towards financial stability and individual affordability. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank the Minister for that detailed answer? Um, when I left the Department in October 21, the Minister might not be aware, other, other than the fact we had a brief conversation this morning, there were some on-the-shelf proposals in relation to prescription charges, um, where there had been an awful lot of hard work um, done already by the officers and DHSC <coughs> around this. I was wondering if the Minister um, is aware of what potentially happened to those proposals. Was it a case of they weren't just going to be progressed and the Department wanted to start again? Um, or is it still the plans that those on-the-shelf proposals may come forward uh, in the near future. <clears throat> Mr. To reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to look at those proposals. I mean, prescription charges on the, on the Isle of Man are well over a review, and it is very high on my priority list to deal with this as soon as we can in respect of getting that fairness to how much we actually charge for prescription charges. So I can assure the member and the court that this is high on the priority to be looked at as soon as possible. Supplementary, Mrs. Christian. Thank you. Mr. President, um, the Minister might not be able to answer this uh, as he's so new in the role. Um, however, when will his department introduce a once a year prescription charge for HRT? Some patients going through the menopause have two hormones and have to pay double the prescription chart. This legislation was passed in the UK last year in October. Why are we lagging behind? And could the Minister commit to looking at this? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'm happy to look at that, but at the moment, you know, people can pay for um, a prepayment certificate. They, these are cost £54, and that represents 12 months, or they can do £19 for four months, and these are for Alaman residents over the age of 16. But I'm happy to engage with um, the member to see if we can help in that particular area. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. In 2017, the proposals hit turbulence in Comin. Is the current Council Minister supportive of an increase in the price of prescriptions being progressed? Thank you very much. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr <coughs> President. In my short time as the Minister and within the Council of Ministers, this has not been discussed, but I have had a conversation with the Treasury Minister recently, um, and I've already outlined in that conversation that this is a high priority, and I do want to get the fairness, because as I've said in my original speech there, we are now collecting around about £60 million, pounds, or sorry, we are, we are actually paying £60 million pounds for our drugs on the Isle of Man, and we're actually giving away almost £15 million pounds of that for free. So we're only collecting £1 million. Pounds. And as I say, the cost per item at the moment is around £10 pounds per item, but we're charging around £3.85 pounds per item. We do need to get this completely reviewed, and we do need to get an element of fairness. And as I've said, this is a priority for the department. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. Um, and can I thank, again thank the Minister for his comprehensive answers this morning. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, in terms of the phased approach, is there any time scales on that as to the, which the Department is working? Um, obviously, this has gone on for many years, as the Minister has already said. In fact, he's actually now um, the sixth 
Minister for Health since the prescription charges last actually were fundamentally changed. Um, and can I also ask the Minister, does he agree that if we are going to have fairness, one of the things that massively needs to be looked at as part of that is the exemptions? And can I also wish him the best of luck because I tried twice as Minister for Health to bring forward changes um, and got nowhere. I hope he has more success than I had. Minister to reply. And thank you, Mr. President. Unfortunately, I don't have a timescale. I've literally just picked this up in the last two weeks. And I do thank the Honourable Member for his question because it did bring the information to my attention and especially the urgency of a review. He's absolutely right. We do need to look at the exemptions of, and how much people are charged per item for Isle of Man prescriptions. So I don't have a timescale, but it is high on my agenda. And as the previous Health Minister, I'm actually happy to engage with him to, to, ob to obviously get his input from what he tried in previous occasions. Final supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. Final supplementary. Um, the, the Minister may not have this figure to hand, but um, can I ask the Minister, if he doesn't, will he circulate it? Would the Minister be able to tell us or circulate to us how much the current prescription, um, prescription charges and prepaid certificates actually raises in a financial year? Minister to reply. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I will double check the information. As I say, the total bill for the Isle of Man Health Service is around £16 million, of that of which £15 million is covered within some form of, of um, exemption. So we're only collecting around £1 million at the moment. That is why I feel the system is not fair and we need to be reviewed. So thank you, Mr. President. On to uh, question 10. I call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care what progress has been made developing a service for my elder handicapped ME, chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID, whether the new service is accepting referrals and if you will make a statement. Colin Chavesha, Sland, Karel, Atia, Minister for Health and Social Care, to reply. Thank you, um, Mr. President, and I thank the Honourable Member for her question. Following the confirmation of funding for the ME and CFS and long COVID in the budget sitting of Timwald in February 2022 and the subsequent release of funding to Manx Care on 1 April 2022, a project team was established comprising of a dedicated project lead and a clinical specialist to work on the project full-time. Their work has included setting up the ME and CFS and Long Covid multidisciplinary team, development of referral criteria, formulation of clinical pathways, development of job descriptions for the team, development of patient information and securing premises for the team a considerable achievement in just six months. However, this was helped significantly by our connections to subject matter experts in the UK, provided by our friends in the ME Support Isle of Man. After an expansion, after an expansion of the multidisciplinary team to three clinicians, two therapists, one clinical a psychologist and a GP with special interest in ME, CFS and Long Covid over the summer. The service soft launched in mid-September, meaning the patients who have been waiting on the list for the longest have started to be triaged into preparation for commencement of assessment and treatment. Until the full team is in place, which includes additional clinical members of the team plus administrative support, referrals from GPs will not be open due to the risks of overwhelming the service without the correct service resources being in place. It is anticipated that the service will be fully open to referrals within the next four weeks, subject to of any data protection impact assessments. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you. I think the Minister for his reply was disappointing to hear that the service is still not up and running in September as it was intended. Um, can he inform us, will the service include paediatric provision? And if not, when will support be improved for young people? Minister to reply. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Just, I'm, I'm not sure if the, the member heard what I said. The service has soft lunch, so we are actually accepting people. The ones who have been on the list the longest are now being prepared for the commencement of assessment and treatment. So the service is up and running. It's just not fully open with referrals from GPs, as I said in my opening statement. But hopefully that part will be fully operational within four weeks. With regards to the additional services that the member has mentioned this morning, I will just check with the team and I'll write to her formally and to members of this court. Supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr President. Would the Minister agree with me that it's welcome news um, that the service is now soft-launched okay. um, and the fact that this actually has a unique opportunity to be a groundbreaking um, service and that hopefully in years to come other jurisdictions will look at um, and be able to mirror. Can I ask the Minister, is it the intention um, both of the Department and the service, um, once it's fully launched, to continue to engage with the ME support group and also seek feedback from them? Um, as the service goes on so that we can develop the service and make it better as we continue with continuous improvement. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I fully um, support um, the member's comments. It is a welcome news that we're now able to offer this service. A lot of people behind the scenes have worked tirelessly over the last few years to make sure this service is now up and running. And I would like to put on record my sincere thanks to the ME supporters group in the Isle of Man and all the work that they've done in respect of developing, I'm sure that we will be getting feedbacks and the service will be developed in over the, the months and years to come in order to ensure it, it meets the needs of the poor, poor people using the service. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. <coughs> I mean, while I do welcome the establishment of this service, it still sounds that much of it is for the future while the soft launch is underway. Can the Minister give an indication how many patients um, it is anticipated will require this service and what proportion are currently being triaged in the system? And I'd be grateful if you'd also indicate what proportion of those are young people under the age of 18. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't have those numbers with me this morning, but I will uh, write formally to the member and to members of this court in due course. On to question 11. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castamalu, Mr. Glover. I'd <clears throat> like to ask the uh, Minister for Health and Social Care what input his department is having on pharmacy provision in Ramsey and on drug supplies more generally, and if he'll make a statement. Minister for Health and Social Care to reply. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question this morning. The provision of community pharmacy services is run by private contractors, and the management of this mandated is mandated to Manx Care. We currently have 23 community pharmacies on Ireland, of which 11 are Lloyd's Pharmacy, and in Ramsey, and Ramsey has three pharmacies, all of which are Lloyd's owned. Lloyds have been struggling to staff all of their pharmacies for some time, but this has particularly affected Ramsey as Lloyds have a monopoly in the north of the island. The island has always relied heavily on a pharmacist locums from the UK and Ireland. However, in recent months, it has become increasingly difficult to source pharmacists as they have depleted in the UK, which, is a direct effect, which has a direct effect on the, the island man. Manxcare has been working with Lloyd's Pharmacy on Ireland and at their head office in order to fully understand the problems. A weekly SIP, SIT rep situation report is being produced every week to give an oversight of the issues and any patient um, safety concerns. The primary care pharmacy team were also physically supporting the Ramsey stores to remain open and safe in April and May 2022. However, this is not a sustainable long-term solution and Lloyds are continuing with a recruitment plan for all of their stores but focusing on the Ramsey provision. Our medicine supplies on the Isle of Man are almost exclusively from wholesale de dealers located in the UK and this includes our community pharmacies and at, at Seb Nobles. Drug supplies are a national and international challenge 
for these wholesale dealers, with many struggling to source certain drugs, particularly since the COVID-19, especially with COVID-19 restrictions. This is due to many factors, including a lack of raw materials for um, drug manufacturing and for many factories which manufacture medicines in such countries as India and China, who have now closed or struggling to maintain um, supply chains. Drug supplies also appear to have been affected by Brexit, as some European countries are no longer exporting to the UK. All pharmacies, both multiples and independent pharmacies, and the hospital <coughs> pharmacy are affected by medicine shortages. However, many shortages are short-term and can be managed by transferring medicine supply from one pharmacy to another. There is little that the Department of Health and Social Care or Manx Care can do with these short, within these shortages because they happen quickly and very often without any warning. However, Manx Care is keeping GP surgery, uh, surgeries and local pharmacies up to date when shortages happen, along with providing advice should patients need to be supplied with alternative medicines. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Glover. Good reminder, Dr. and I thank the Minister for that uh, comprehensive reply. And uh, I had a pass and was in Ramsey uh, within the uh, past month and was actually very shocked to see the situation at, uh, at Lloyd's at ShopRite, where the queue was out the door and round the corner with people talking about having queued for over two hours. And then, and why I ask about the drug supply issue, only getting half of the prescription that they were wanting to collect, meaning they've then got to go back and actually queue again to get the remainder of their prescription. So my question really is on the drug supply side of things, uh, can the department and uh, in liaison with Manx Care uh, be quite upfront with the public about the current situation uh, uh, and uh, uh, publicise it a little bit better? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I also visited um, the Ramsey Shoprite Pharmacy, and I, I too witnessed um, queues waiting for prescriptions. So I absolutely acknowledge that point. I will speak to the team, not just within the department, but also within Manx Care, to make sure the communications and the comms are better. I think sometimes people all seem to go at the same sort of time, so I would ask people maybe to go at different times during the day if they can. But I fully acknowledge that point, and we will pick that up with regard to communications. Supplementary, Mr. Hooper. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to thank the Department, uh, Max Care, and the Group Practice in Ramsey for all the work they've done trying to get this issue resolved. But would the Minister agree with me that, that the monopoly provision in Ramsey is currently not serving the town well, and that the current service levels are clearly not acceptable? I wonder if the Minister will be able to outline briefly for this Honourable Court uh, how he intends to resolve the situation and a rough timescale as well for when we can expect this situation to be rectified. Minister to reply. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. As we all know, and I think the people in the North of the Island especially, this particular problem has been ongoing for several months. But I can assure um, the previous Health Minister that this has been picked up in the last two weeks. I have already spoken to the team. I've already had conversations and meetings with Manxcare. We are looking at maybe um, adding an additional pharmacist in Ramsey, an independent pharmacist, but that's going to take some time to go through all of the application. But I also need to look at the regulations in order to ensure that they are fit for purpose for what we need. That work has already started. In respect of the timescale, I don't really have a timescale with me, but I'm hoping this can be resolved as soon as it's physically possible, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Wannamoo. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the fragile nature of drug supply and security, would the Minister welcome a local company setting up and providing such supply and security, and has he liaised with his colleague in the Department of Enterprise to see if such a facility can be set up? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, um, Mr. President. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, the Isle of Man gets its um, supply of drugs from wholesale dealers in the UK. As I've also mentioned in my opening remarks, this is a national and international challenge to all wholesale dealers at the moment. We're trying to work through them, I, as they are having conversations with Manxcare, to try and make sure that any impact on the Isle of Man is kept to a minimum. But if um, the Honourable Member has any suggestions, I'm more than happy to engage with him and to have that conversation. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Glover. 
I'm going to remind Hector Anne. Will the Minister also uh, publicise the facts? Because a lot of people are getting caught out by the fact they're used to 48 hours or two working days to be able to then collect their prescription. At the moment, it's 72 hours that's being posted in chemists, and people are going out uh, and then uh, returning empty handed because they're still going under the old regime. Minister to reply. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. President. I'm happy to take that point away and to look at it because, as I say, if people are being asked to wait longer than normal, then we need to make sure the communication around you know, when the prescription is submitted, when will it be available, to make sure that's very clear. And I will take that message away and actually speak to Manx Care directly. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Wannenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there is such a company trying to set up at the moment. I'm not sure if the Minister is aware of that. Um, if he isn't, I'm disappointed, frankly. Um, the Minister of Enterprise is aware of that, and this company is trying to set up despite the odds, uh, and seems to have been kicked down the road for quite a while now. So I would suggest he's given me the suggest suggestion to ask him. Could I suggest that he speaks to his colleague and try and get this going forward? Yeah. Thank you. Minister, care to respond? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I guess the Isle of Man you know, offers tens of thousands of different types of medications and drugs um, over the course of a year. I'm not 100% sure what particular medicine or drug the Honourable Member is talking about. If he wants to send me details, more than happy to speak to the DfE Minister. But as I've said, the Isle of Man obtains its drug supply um, from the UK, and this is a national and international problem that we're trying to overcome. Thank you. Final supplementary, Mr Glover. I'm going to remind Hector, and just in respect of that last uh, uh, non-answer, really, shouldn't he be talking with his fellow minister? <coughs> yeah. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I mean, the Honourable Mo Member from Douglas North, all he mentioned was a drug. As I say, the Isle of Man supplies tens of thousands of drugs on mm -hmm. the island. I have no information about the drugs, so it's hard to answer the question unless he's actually talking about a specific drug. But I'll leave it there, Mr. President, because I'm more than happy to engage with any member if they've got a solution to the problem we're facing. But I'm not aware of what the member is actually talking about. Give Mr. Warnerberg an opportunity to articulate that answer. That uh, Thank you. I'll try and break it down as simply as I can. There, there is a company that is trying to set up here, a pharmaceutical company, not peculiar just to one drug, but a company trying to set up to supply drugs and import drugs and manufacture drugs. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, thank, down, you thank you, Mr. President. As I say, if the member wants to write to me formally, I will pick it up and speak to Manx Care directly. Thank you. Move on to question 12, and I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I beg to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what consideration has been given to the use of regular shuttle buses to service both the hospital and the airport. Call on Shavashak Buntraglas, Minister for Infrastructure, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Bus Van Inn provides regular bus services that serve both the hospital and the airport. Services undergo regular review, normally with an annual timetable that reflects service changes as a result of service demand. Specific shuttle services are not currently being considered by the Department. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, as someone who doesn't drive, um, can I, can, I ask, um, can I ask the Minister, does he believe, though, that the current setup with the timetables and the way the bus routes works is actually the most efficient, where you try to drive multiple services from different areas of the island, round the hospital, round the <coughs> airport, which extends the service time for some of the routes quite considerably? Would the Minister not agree that perhaps a much more sensible approach would be that taken in many other jurisdictions, where if you're travelling to the hospital or you're travelling to the airport, you go to a central location where there is a shuttle bus that actually takes you to the onward journey and can run every 20 minutes from those destinations? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. The airport service is actually every 20 minutes in both directions for the majority of the day from Monday through to Sunday. The hospital is served by a number of services with a maximum of an hourly service in both directions. The, uh, the honourable questioner does describe, I think, the rationale for the current timetable, which is based on uh, um, sort of circular routes, including the hospital particularly. Um, and one alternative would be the uh, proposal as, uh, made by the questioner, which would be to have a central place at which a change was, took place from various parts of the island to get on a bus to the, um, to the uh, hospital. 
for instance, and perhaps also to the airport, although both cases are different. I repeat, the service is under review at the moment, and I welcome the, uh, the feel for the mood of this honourable court and the wider public about that. That's actually a fundamental change to the basis of, uh, of the timetables in the Isle of Man and the service routes. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, you know, the minister referred there to circular routes. I am going to resist the temptation to mention about going round in circles. Um, but in relation to this, Mr. President, in his opening answer, the minister said that it wasn't under consideration, but then has just suggested that perhaps it is being looked at and it is feeding into the wider look at timetables. And um, so, can I ask, Mr. President, which is it? Is it not being considered by the department, or is it something that will feed into their review? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The, the annual review that normally takes place has just taken place. The service uh, schedule, the timetable is in place for 12 months. However, there is an ongoing review of bus vanning, including the way that services are operated, the fleet, and so many other aspects of the buses. Um, it's often argued that what people need is not to change buses, and that is the basis of the current timetabling service. If the Manx public and the people who use buses want to move over to a different system of shuttle buses, that's something that needs to come up inside the fundamental review, which is ongoing. Supplementary, Lorda. Uh, good morning, Alec There's a few things that I'd just like to pick the Minister's brains on. Um, firstly, the, the Minister said that uh, the review had just been undertaken and was for a year, but I understood that there was going to be a fundamental review ahead of the spring launch of the timetable, and perhaps he would just like to uh, be, be clear about that. Would the Minister also um, agree to look at the revenue data that he's had? The, there was a shuttle bus. Um, from both the South and Douglas to the airport. It was once every 15 minutes. That's about how frequently you'd run a shuttle bus anyway. Uh, would he look at the data that uh, was available for that service when that was operating compared to that on the contingency timetable and what he's currently offering as a, as a, uh, a bus service to the airport, which is less frequent and, I suspect, less attractive to consumers? Minister to reply. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Mr President. And Huge respect for the honourable questioner's uh, knowledge of, um, of bus routes, bus timetables, the basis of public bus system, and I look forward to engaging with the honourable questioner as I have done. Um, the, minister, the questioner is absolutely right. Revenue data, cost data needs to be analysed fundamentally, and it is being in the ongoing bus review. There have been uh, different services in the past and different costs in the past. We've got an opportunity with this fundamental review in the timetable that the um, that the uh, questioner has suggested, uh, and we can do things as quickly as possible. The, uh, the general public would have expected us to stabilise the bus system first, and that has been largely completed. Secondly, we are beginning to, uh, we're just leading up to the very bold potentially transformational fare capping system, which comes in in the 1st of November, and the whole basis of routes. Is, um, is something else in the, uh, in the list of um, scope of the bus review, which is also wider, is also part of the wider uh, transport strategy, which is also ongoing at the moment. Complimentary, Mr Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr President. Would the Minister agree that one of the advantages of using shuttle buses, be at the airport or to the hospital, mm. is that it can ensure that people using public transport can get to their appointments on time if it's a regular service? Um, can I ask the Minister, does DOI engage with other departments, such as the Department for Health or Manx Care, as it is now, um, around ensuring that their timetables actually meet the requirements of the passengers? Because I am aware that certain routes either get you there ridiculously early for appointments it's all ridiculously late. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The department does a liaise with a patient transfer in respect of health, and indeed, I had a very productive and helpful meeting with the former Minister uh, for Health and Social Care about the officer group that's been meeting for some time between DOI and DHSC about patient transfers. I do also agree that the timetable and the bus routes need to serve real people's real purposes, like getting to the airport and like getting to hospital services. And I do think that's uh, an important um, um, aspect to the ongoing and fundamental um, public transport and indeed public bus service review. Move on to question 13. I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas Central, Mrs Corlett. Required by Tibble's resolution of the 22nd of October 2020. 
Thank you. Call on Shavesh Ockburn Troglas, Minister for Infrastructure, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Following the Tinwald resolution in October 2020, the Department undertook a technical feasibility assessment to implement 20 mile per hour speed limits in the island's residential areas. Although this has not been published, Minister Baker provided an update to Tinwald members in May 2021 on behalf of the Department, detailing the progress of the initiative. Subsequent to this, Tinwald members were briefed in July 2021 at a presentation in the Brule Suite with the recommendations for implementation. Perhaps what is of most interest to members is where the department is in terms of implementation of the 20 mile per hour speed limits. Currently three 20 mile per hour speed zones are in delivery in Ramsey Town Centre, in Port St Mary and in Castletown. A further scheme in Central Douglas is being progressed with public engagement starting early next year. Progress on delivering on more residential schemes will be dependent on funding and staff resources, such resources required to manage the project and to allow proper engagement with local authorities, residents and other stakeholders on proposals. The engagement process is critical to the successful implementation of the schemes, and whilst it takes time, it is important to have local support for the plans. I hope members agree. Supplementary, Mrs Corlett. Um, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, while, I, while I welcome the Minister's update on what's happened so far, um, does he feel that, you know, that it was enough to invite members to a presentation in the Brule Street to give an update, when actually there's huge public interest in this? And, and the, the resolution made by Tibble was to bring back a report to this court by March, the 20, March, by March 2021. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I really uh, appreciate Mrs., uh, the Honourable Questioner's engagement on this issue and involvement in this issue. And uh, I hope the Honourable Questioner understands that uh, I can't really speak for the decisions that were made by the previous government and the Minister for Infrastructure before the last election. Having said that, I absolutely agree that um, Honourable Members need to be involved in the development of um, the transport strategy, which includes. Um, includes uh, 20 mile per hour speed limits and other residential um, roads aspects. That's why we had the uh, briefing in the Brule Suite for current Timberwolves members um, over the summer. And I hope the Honourable Questioner can accept that uh, schemes that are currently under consideration in Ramsey, Castletown, Port St Mary, and then subsequently a, a larger scheme around Balakameen High School in Central Douglas is actually practical implementation on the ground inside the budget and the human resources that the department has available. Supplementary, Mr Mercer. Thank you, Mr President. Um, notwithstanding what we've heard so far from this minister, Previous ministers did not bring their recommendations to Timwell for debate. That is what was asked for in this amendment, and it was supported by um, a unanimous uh, vote in this, uh, in this chamber. There is a big public interest in this. When will this minister bring his department's recommendations to Timwell for debate? Here, here. Minister to reply. Okay. The... Um, uh, 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 the island plan the island plan commits the most recent version to a, a transport strategy by July 2014 the, the, that strategy is being developed in terms of modules that will be implemented whilst the strategy is being um, sorry, 2024 if I accidentally said 2014 I could see some surprise from members people so by 2024 July 2024 originally the first version of the island plan committed a strategic transport services review by July 2023. That's my recollection. So, having said that, and based on discussions with Timbal members over the summer, uh, we are working on modules as part of that strategy, and I can expect uh, current, the current thinking of, of yours truly is that um, the first thing could perhaps be a principles of the whole transport strategy coming to Timwell would be uh, alongside work being developed specifically around things like 20 mile per hour zones, particularly around schools as intended by the Timwell resolution. The technical feasibility report, which allowed the department to prioritise delivery, delivery, did not actually provide detailed design information, which is what I think the public are interested in. And the public will be 
definitely not universally um, pleased by whatever is proposed in terms of uh, traffic management schemes. Moreover, the budget bid that Mr. Minister Baker had in mind during the times when he was making those, when Timber was deciding those things and resolving those things, wasn't actually ever funded. Um, so the amount of money that's being worked on in this space, with in this space, is tiny compared to what was envisaged before the general election, when a five-year um, plan was envisaged for this exact purpose. So, um, Tim Wald can uh, any member of Tim Wald can move any motion. <coughs> The department engaged with Timwald members during the summer and is working on an all-encompassing transport strategy and the speed limits and the alternatives for safer roads is a very important part of that. I'm very pleased to be working with people like the Department of Home Affairs and I congratulate the Honourable Questioner on his new appointment and his active participation in the Joint Department of Home Affairs DOI working group around some of these things. Supplementary, Mrs Corlett. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the Minister mentioned there priorities around schools, and part of the amendment was for priority to be given to the areas around schools. So how much work has been done on that particular part of it? How many of our area schools have street restrictions surrounding them, and how many do not? Minister to reply. Um, there are 30... Um, five or so primary schools in the Isle of Man and five secondary schools. I think rather than uh, rather than trying to uh, to improvise an answer, I'm going to circulate and put in the public domain that information about what exists around all schools. Be quicker to send the report. Supplementary, Dr. Hayward. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, with regards to Ports Mary, I know those detailed plans that you mentioned earlier do exist and have existed for nearly two years now, um, and. It's a, a sad indictment of how joined up the department is not working at the moment that you've recently resurfaced one of the roads which actually needed a build-out curb and you've put the new surface down on a bit of road that's going to disappear into becoming pavement should the scheme come through fruition. Given that it has been well over two years since that scheme was approved by the local commissioners, when are you anticipating that it, work on the ground is actually likely to start? Because Port St Mary remains one of those schools without any speed protection around it for the children that travel. Minister to reply. Okay, well, I'll have to uh, check the situation then in terms of speed limits around the um, school because uh, um, <coughs> so that's something I'll have to check. In terms of uh, working with Port St Mary Commissioners, uh, my understanding is that the departments work closely with Port St Mary Commissioners and has prioritised this work because the Commissioners want it and obviously Port St Mary High Street is a priority, a major priority for the Commissioners and you use the press over the summer to make that point. So I'd like to work um, um, very closely joining up an agenda with Port St Mary Commissioners to actually, with the whole of the Department of Infrastructure to make sure that um, we can actually have some uh, fact-based understanding of what the Commissioners want and behind that what the people of Port St Mary want inside the resources and human and financial that are available to the Department and the relative priority of the Port St Mary projects with those in the rest of the island. Supplementary, Mrs. Collett. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, could I just ask the Minister actually whether he will assure us all that this is a priority for him, particularly around schools? Because active travel should be stopped with encouraging children to walk to school, especially secondary schools, as students don't need to be accompanied. How, how high on, on the Minister's priority <coughs> Minister to reply. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. The uh, road safety is paramount. Uh, walking to schools is also very important to me. I do get as many, I, get, I do get as many emails from people who uh, resent children having to walk their children having to walk to school rather than as, as people who are encouraging you know want me to encourage people to walk to school. So, you know, I get I've got quite a large email correspondence list about uh, about. Um, about uh, people who want there to be a, a, an exemption on the ability to have free bus transport, for instance, because they live uh, more than a mile away, but um, uh, the way that they see it, but not according to the way that the map measures it, and so on. So we do need to engage about getting to schools. Safety is paramount. Nothing can be compromised for safety. The, the transport strategy has got to be evidence-based and evidence-led, and wouldn't it have been great if we'd have had a lot more money in a five-year plan for all of these schemes around residential roads, and wouldn't it have been great if this government 
hadn't uh, prioritised this more if it really is important f uh, for us all. And that sort of thing can only come from a tin uh, resolution. And I, uh, honourable members and the public, should await this space in terms of the principles that, that will be uh, will need to be debated in this honourable court um, before we get to settling the transport strategy in July 2024. Move on to question 14. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castel Malou, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what maximum income level is for prospective social housing tenants and how this figure is calculated. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The income thresholds for access to public sector general needs housing were last updated when Tim Wald agreed the public sector housing general needs allocations policy in 2019. The maximum income level, which applies to joint applications with three or more children, is currently set at £44,000 per annum. Income thresholds have previously been set based upon increases that are in line with average wage increases. Income thresholds for access to public so ho sector housing are under review. Recent economic data seems to show that an increase in line with average wage increases on this occasion would be insufficient due to the high rates of price inflation. The Department intends to consult formally with local authorities about updated income thresholds as soon as possible. These have also been considered at the ongoing regional workshops with housing providers. I expect to come to Timwald with the revised policy this parliamentary year. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for a lovely bit of cherry-picking there. Um, my concern is that out of all the options available, the Minister went for a couple with three children. If we actually look at the actual data available, when it comes down to a couple without children, the level appears to be much lower, potentially 33,000, which I would like the Minister to confirm. If it is 33,000, then there's a massive difference in terms of looking at couples on the minimum wage. If a couple is on the minimum wage and both working full time, they're going to be earning £37,000. If you've actually got a couple working full time on the living wage, both working full time, they're going to be earning £43,000, £10,000 above this level, and very, very close to the 44000 for a family with three children. Could the Minister please give us a bit more detail, please, in terms of couples with no children? Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister, to reply. Um, yeah, the uh, honourable question is correct. For no children, a joint applicant, the maximum gross income is 33,000. But I answered the question, which is what is the maximum income level for prospective social housing tenants? It didn't tell me anything more about the social housing tenants. So rather than reading out eight different numbers, I thought I would just answer the question as set. But the, the questioner is exactly correct, which is for no. For no children, joint application, the maximum gross income is 33,000. As I've said, um, this is actively under consideration in the excellent regional workshops that commissioners, councillors, housing professionals, clerks are attending at the moment. <coughs> I've seen so far an excellent one in the south in Colby and an excellent one over in the Western Wellbeing <coughs> last week. And next week we have the, the ones in the north and in the, in, and in the east. And we've already got six next steps that we're considering in terms of this uh, policy issue, which the housing professionals, those excellent people who work in the local authorities and in the DOI, have put together for political buy-in. So we've got a process in place. Then there will be formal consultation with the local authorities. As I've said in my answer, um, minimum wage, living wage, medium wage need to be considered alongside alongside uh, price inflation and as price inflation is so much higher than wage inflation at the moment I would think that the Minister met the question would actually prefer price inflation rather than wage inflation. Having said that we are looking at all of these issues alongside fixed term tenancies, the access and eligibility criteria, the mid-rent proposal and I'm confident that this parliamentary year we can make absolutely huge progress in terms of um, well, eight years on from the initiation of the whole business of reforming access and eligibility criteria, putting people on fixed term tenancies and linking that with new schemes like mid-rent and perhaps even beyond that to rent to buy schemes and other forms of alternative provision of public housing. I mentioned Mr Morehouse. Thank you Mr President and thank you Minister for that level of detail. 
in, in terms of the change to these bans, it's going to take quite some time. Given that situation, is there any flexibility that can be shown? I'm aware of one couple in my constituency who are just about £1,000 above the maximum income they can earn. And at the moment, no flexibility can be shown. Is there any possibility that flexibility can be shown until the new bans actually are pushed through? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much. So it's, it's a policy, um, and the, the, I can't get into discussing any individual cases, but the access and eligibility criteria are approved by Tenwood in the manner of being a scheme, even though it's a policy in the law rather than a scheme. At the end of this process, it seems to me helpful to regularise this situation by putting in place a scheme um, regulations under statute rather than a policy under statute. Um, and I'm sure the officers, being very sympathetic, empathetic people, will try to understand every, every individual situation to find out um, exactly to make sure that the, uh, the, um, the limits are understood by the applicant and are being interpreted properly by the, uh, by the um, person making the decision about the provision. Um, Supplementary, Lauder. Good morning, Mr. Uh, can I ask the Minister what sort of policy objectives and policy options he's considering uh, taking out to these uh, workshops um, when he's looking at setting income levels? For example, is he looking at the proportion of the population that would be eligible for public sector housing? Is he looking at the demand and the supply um, of different housing types to see how many people can be uh, fitted into uh, to these different housing types? So. Uh, what, what are the policy objectives here that he is taking to the country through this? Um, is, it, is it purely just going to be based on incomes and earnings, or is it also going to be a little bit more sophisticated in looking at the housing stock we have available and trying to match that up with the people in most need of it? Minister to reply. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, very penetrating questions from the uh, Mr Speaker, as you would expect. And on the table for policy would be the question about what's the public sector housing stock to be used for and what are the principles about that use. But these regional workshops are being, are being targeted to be as, as useful as possible. I, I'm absolutely sure now from having been through half of them that everybody's gone in with a brain fully engaged and with their ears open to listen and learn. And we're, we're considering fixed term tenancies, we're considering allocation policy both in terms of prioritisation and in terms of access and eligibility thresholds, we're considering how it works in practice in terms of the exceptions that people are coming across, we've collectively put together the data about what rent people are actually paying at the moment and we're thinking through connections with the shared equity scheme and the mid-rents and the six uh, next steps which uh, you know, commissioners and councillors have already seen and they're being published if they're not already published are, are, are precisely worked up by the professionals on the front line dealing with real people's situations so it would obviously be for Timwell Court eventually to decide the use of the 6,000 6, or so public sector houses and nearly 5,000 general houses and I do hope that um, we can come forward with, uh, um, exp in personally, as Minister of Infrastructure, I believe that the future is likely to include a greater role for the mid-rent housing pilot and expanding the mid-rent housing pilot in Colby. And, uh, and given the profile of the current occup um, people who live in public sector housing, I do imagine that uh, the use of public sector housing will be changing in, uh, in coming years, especially if we can do something about um, better quality care, extra care and sheltered housing arrangements, because we have quite an old demography inside our public sector housing stock. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for all these detailed answers. Um, my core concern goes back to the actual issue in terms of the gap between the current maximum income levels and the, the link to the minimum wage and the living wage. Given that there's that massive disparity at the moment, can that simply be focused on as a separate issue and taken out of the wider context and some changes made there? Um, the real pressure in the private sector market at the moment in terms of availability, a three-bedroom home in my constituency on the market at the moment is £18,600 a year. It's a massive amount. Um, is that something that can be looked at just in terms of the current maximum levels? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, um, 
Ken, thanks for the excellent question. I agree it's absolutely pressing. I've made a commitment to come back with uh, new thresholds for the access and eligibility criteria with, within this parliamentary year, and the team is focused on it, as are local authority housing providers. These link to shared equity scheme. They will have to link to a decision being made about fixed-term tenancies and the rent paid by the 100 or so people who are already paying additional rents um, to stay inside public sector housing along the lines that Mr Speaker has um, hinted at. So I, I think everybody agrees that something's got to change. Exactly how we change it will be subject to Tim Wood approval when the, um, the new policy comes back this parliamentary year. Within a two or three year time frame, we could fundamentally transform how public sector housing is used and how the provision is organised. to Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. There's been lots of use of the word income, both in the answers and the questions. Can I ask the Minister, is there plans as part of this review to actually look at what is classed as income? Um, because one of the things I'm aware of, and this affects not just those on the housing list, as Mr. Morehouse's question relates to, but also those that the Minister's spoken about are currently on fixed term tenancies, where I'm aware of people who have received one-off bonuses or actually are doing what would be none repeated in the following year over time um, who have actually had that classed as income. So, for instance, I'm aware of one couple who are current tenants who worked in health and social care doing it overtime during the pandemic and as a result it's been classed as their income and their rent has gone up an ex exceptionally large amount. There's also someone I'm aware of who's done, again, non-repetitive overtime that has pushed their income up and has now actually been removed from the housing list they were on. So can I ask the Minister, is there a plan to look at what the definition of income is as well as part of this? Uh, yes. Minister so how to deal him. with... Uh, Mr President, yes, how to deal with... Um, large lump sums is definitely an issue that comes up over and over again and that's one thing that we want to do the types of income and arbitraging the types of income is also something else so it's ridiculous it's ridiculous if people are if people are reduced, having to reduce their earnings potential and their take home income just to stay within thresholds so especially in Peel uh, last week, so we, had, we had some very imaginative um, solutions about debureaucratising de the process to avoid the sorts of arbitration process. So this is exactly the sort of practical question that it's only really frontline housing professionals will know about, given their rich experience and rich knowledge of actual people's situation with, with the current application of fixed-term tenancies and that actual application of the access and eligibility criteria. So, yes, th these things are all being taken into account this year. It's something to come back to Tim Wood this parliamentary year. Supplementary, Mrs Masker. Thank you, Mr President. Um, would, would the Minister, who is also Chairman of the Housing and Communities Board, agree with me that many of the matters that have been raised today have been brought up when we've done, uh, not just in, in our board meetings, but doing our regional workshops, um, would he uh, confirm, as, as my view is, that these matters have been raised and are alive and it's that there are many difficult situations coming to our notice. Um, but one of the key factors will be um, getting the right people in the right houses and this embraces a lot of the questions that are coming forward today. Um, one of the matters, would, would the Minister agree that the quick fix that we did on the, on the shared equity scheme has addressed one aspect of the issues that are coming to our notice, but um, it, it, it will be important as we go forward that we do engage with local authorities. Some great ideas coming from the operational bodies and uh, uh, would the Minister agree with me that the Housing and Communities Board has also got its eye on this ball and hopefully will come forward with some major steps that will make a difference in, in this piece? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I welcome the question and I confirm that the issues that are being raised in this Honourable Court match those that are coming up in the regional workshops and in the Housing and Communities Board's discussion. <coughs> I'd also like to thank uh, the Vice-Chair and um, members of the Housing and Communities Board for attending some of these regional workshops. And I think it's also great that the Housing Division of, of uh, DOI plus the Secretariat of the, of the uh, Housing and Communities Board plus at director level um, Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture, Housing and DOI Housing have all been at these uh, regional workshops to listen and learn from councillors and commissioners and clerks and housing managers in the region. Some great ideas are coming up and it would be wrong if we don't capture those in the, uh, in the new um, 
policy that I expect to come this parliamentary year and in the more fundamental review that's ongoing. Final supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, can I ask the Minister what the timescales are for these workshops to fully take place and also be completed? The Minister mentioned that he expects to make huge progress in this parliamentary year. Can I ask, Mr President, what the Minister means by huge progress? Does that mean we'll have decided what we're looking at, or does he actually, as he seemed to indicate in his previous answer, perhaps he will firm it up and say that we will have reached a conclusion and there will be something before this Honourable Court, before the end of the parliamentary year, because these are issues that are affecting people on the ground right here, right now. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr President, and again for the helpful question. The, um, the, the, the last two regional workshops will take place next week. They were scheduled for this week, but you know, there's a possibility that Tim Wald will run into the evenings on three evenings this week, and I didn't want to um, mix that possibility. So the last two, the one in um, the one in Braddon and the one in Jerby, will take place um, next week. They would have taken place about uh, four four weeks ago, but uh, but uh, sadly we had the period of national mourning, and we had to uh, postpone them because of the period of um, a national mourning. What I've committed to today is a new policy this parliamentary year. So once these regional workshops have concluded, we'll be making some specific formal consultation with housing authorities to actually inform that policy that needs to come to Timwald uh, Court for, 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 for approval. In terms of the more fundamental review, it depends how that formal consultation goes, because on the table are access and eligibility, allocation policy, fixed term tenancies. So for instance, you know, the, the public should know that 54% of people are now on five-year fixed-term tenancies, and 100 of those 3,100 people are actually paying more rent for their houses than the people next door, conceivably, because of the application of the, um, of the fixed-term tenancy rent policy. These things are on the table. The local authorities have given me the impression, and I think Mrs Masker the impression um, to date, that they want government to do something in terms of taking forward the fixed term tenancy policy and the allocation policy and the access and eligibility criteria. It can't come from them, it has to come from us, and I think that's what I've heard. So if I hear that in Jerby and Braddon from the Eastern and the Northern Commissioners, I'll be absolutely sure that we've got a consensus that we have to do something fundamental. And this year, the commitment is to come through to, with at least one general policy, and that's in terms of access and eligibility criteria, uh, thresholds, which will also be used for fixed term tenancy reviews and will also be taken into account for the mid rent pilot policy initiatives. Move on to question 15 and I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castamaloo, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Cabinet Office how many delegates signed up to attend the Government Conference and of these, how many used the email addresses ending with at gov.im and b at sch.im. Thank you. Well, on Shaveshaka Conseil, Minister for Cabinet Office, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. There were 751 registrations in advance across all of the sessions on day one of the conference. Of these registrations, 52 used email addresses ending with gov.im and eight used email addresses ending with sch.im. There were 864 registrations in advance across all of the sessions on day two. Of these registrations, 47 used email addresses ending with gov.im and non-used email addresses ending with sch.im. In addition to those pre-registered, approximately 150 people turned up across the two days without pre-registration and were given entry to the conference. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Um, I was surprised to be classified as a delegate when I arrived at the conference. Um, were all Tingle members classified as delegates, and were any other people in that category? And if that's the case, did it break any um, GDPR rules? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, please don't be surprised that we might have hoped and wanted you there, Mr Morehouse, along with them, other <laughs> members of, of Tim Wolves. Um, so there was a certain amount of preparation you know, from staff that went into anticipating um, and hoping of that. As you know, honourable members have been asked to sort of, you know, please, please hopefully to attend and also to help promote the conference to their constituents and others that might be interested in the policy area. So we did always want 
the conference to be open to all um, and mindful of those who um, may be um, digitally excluded on, on, and unable to register online. People were um, encouraged to um, turn up on the day. Um, some then would have had to, have, you know, some may not have had a sort of printed uh, um, tag, if you like. But in addition to those who didn't <coughs> register, register, the team welcomed around 150 people who turned up on the day. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Mercer. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, will the Minister build on what was learned from the first Government conference and ensure that members of the public from all walks of life will be encouraged to attend? Uh, and would the Minister also agree with me that honourable members can also do their bit to publicise this important event as we approach subsequent annual conferences? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I absolutely agree with the honourable members point there, you know, that it is a worthwhile engagement process and actually if, if people want and are interested in the public engagement around the policy areas that happens throughout the conference and is indeed, you know, it was it, the, the sessions were filmed um, too and are, are available online and um, it is important, I think everyone's got a role to play actually to say look please come along in their particular departmental areas or just areas of interest that people are passionate about. Um, so thank you very much for raising that point and yes, Definitely, there will be some learning and taking on board of the feedback. It's the first time of doing this, but quite promptly after the conference ended, um, there was there was some um, surveys and feedback that was that was sought as to anything that might need to change in future. I think we are already aware that actually there may be a benefit to different scheduling to allow people, perhaps you know, with with family or the working commitments. Um, so there will be consideration of that um, in future ideas and developments around. The conference. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in terms of the data set provided, it is interesting in terms of the low numbers used in the at gov.im email address. So there seem to be large numbers of government employees there. In terms of that situation, if there were a large number of government employees there, what benefit does the minister hope to get out of that? Um, I was also interested to see the eight students <coughs> or possibly students, using the SCHIM um, email. Um, I know a group from Castle Russian came, they thoroughly enjoyed the day and got us out of it. Going forward, is that something going to push more to get that student interaction and encourage more young people? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I, I think that would be worthwhile, certainly with the younger people. Um, they, they were all students, I'm um, pretty sure they were all students so far as I'm aware. Um, there were approaches made to different high schools. You're obviously kind of relying on them, um, the probably particularly sixth form teachers allowing their their students out at that time. Um, I would personally like to see more engagement with younger people on this. There will be you know, definitely some um, reflection on that. Um, I did talk to, to try and talk to some of the students who attended. They were sort of sitting back a little bit at the back, and particularly there were more sessions on the first day. I think later on the of interest to them. Um, so yes, definitely like to extend out further. We might have the benefit of a greater lead in time, I think, next time, in terms of what might be expected. We did have that period of time as well, and um, to do with um, the, the Queen's passing in the period of mourning, where actually sort of, you know, it, it felt like it wasn't really, you know, appropriate to push too much on these things. Um, on to the point about attendance by um, um, officers in government. Um, I think that it was really felt that it was important to, to not to not exclude um, public servants, and um, clearly many were there actually in their departmental um, roles, or perhaps um, you know manning, manning some of the stands, um, being on hand um, and involved in panels and questions and things like this. Um, but we did feel it was important for, for officers and public service to be able to join in and, and have their their say. Um, but of course, to try and. You, you know, make sure there wasn't any risk to impact on public services. So there was a message on the 15th of September that went out from the interim chief secretary um, that made it clear that you know, sort of attendance at the conference um, you know, was subject to permission from individual line managers of the addresses that were gov.im. Obviously, you know, there's, there's politicians as well, and attendees at, at panels that would have, have perhaps also used those email addresses. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Dr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'd like to apologise to the Minister because um, after being invited to be on some of the panels, I actually registered, um, which apparently is now frowned upon by the Honourable Member from, for Costa and Arbery and Malou. 
Would the Minister agree with me that actually for the first time such an event has been staged in terms of engagement both with the business sector, the public sector and the general population of the Isle of Man, this was a really good start and actually lays a really firm foundation for building for further events in the future. Thank you. <coughs> Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I absolutely would agree. I don't think there's been anything like it before in terms of public engagement and that openness for ministers <coughs> to actually be put on the spot to outline their their policies, their priorities, and also be, be, be you know, effectively grilled on those. So you know, I absolutely agree um, with the Treasury Minister there. I perhaps also make the point that there were um, you know, additional attendees who joined by events that were, were, were organised over the lunchtime session. So you know, I think that there were events, um, you know, for example, from the um, Chamber of Commerce and also sort of the sponsored sessions that, that, that were actually you know, additional attendees and additional networking opportunities that weren't coming through the um, other registration format for for the conference. But I, I, it was absolutely worthwhile. It can definitely be built on. Um, it's worthwhile for, worthwhile for public engagement and clarity. And um, there was a, an emphasis on the economic strategy. And through that emphasis of engagement, there were 200 additional consultation responses on that important strategy. So I think that combined with the... Um, presentation of policies and priorities in a way that has never been done before has absolutely made it worthwhile. So I hope that next time there might be more engagement from members um, and, and also from, from, from um, different people in departments, but also the public so that we can, we can have that uh, extended engagement to allow people to bring, you know, politicians to bring their policies out to the public, but also for the public to have their say and input on that. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll move on to question 16. Call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castamalu, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture what support is available for children on free school meals whose year group is sent home. Thank you. Call on Chaveshak Inzi, Sport as Culture. Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The Department recognised that in September two schools were forced to ask certain year, group, year groups to study from home. All parents were written to in order to inform them of the situ situation. However, as it now stands, all the department's schools are open to all of our students on roll, meaning that students entitled to a free school meal are now in receipt of one. The department and school leaders prioritise contingency plans and to find attendance alternatives and ways to supervise break times to enable schools to be safely open and accommodate all of our year groups back into school as soon as possible. And initially, there was no arrangements made for lunches for students in receipt of free school meals. If the situation had continued for a longer period of time, provision would have been put in place by the Department. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Given we're still in a very challenging position, are vouchers or the alternative now available? So if a school is to say this afternoon that children aren't coming into school tomorrow, a year group, would vouchers be available for those children who would qualify for free school meals? We're talking about a large number of children, potentially 20% plus for each year group that are taken out of school. So is that ready to go at this point in time? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the Department is currently working with procurement on doing a prior information notice um, in line with procurement and financial regulations. Um, we did put the, this notice out earlier in the year, but it does need to go to a full procurement process now. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Um, we, we need to kind of make sure that goes forward quickly because that could be an issue, especially over the winter period. It's going to get colder. Many of these families are struggling with general cost of living issues. So can that be pushed? Also, in terms of the letter, how much warning do parents have and guardians? Because I'm aware of certain parents who had issues actually providing childcare when the children were out of school for those days. How much warning is there and is there any support mechanism in place for those children who don't have a parent at home? Thank you, Mr <coughs> President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, in terms of the days at home, the first day at home for St Ninians uh, and Balakamine was the 21st of September and um, the schools did inform the parents as soon as they were aware of the staffing difficulties 
Um, St Ninians then wrote to all parents on the 27th to advise that the school would be able to have the contingency measures in place up until half term, so the school fully opened again on the 28th of September. Balakameen was slightly different and um, they wrote to all parents on the 27th to say that due to contingency planning, year 10s could go back into school and um, from Wednesday the 28th it would be open for years 8 and 9 um, and that would mean that these year groups would be in more frequently. And then on Thursday the 29th of September, Balakameen wrote to parents and advised that all year groups should return to school from Monday the 3rd of October. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Um, how active is the Department in actually assessing the quality of work and the support for the children these days? We learnt a lot over the COVID period, as that actually proved beneficial when we've had these days. And also, there's been anecdotal, anecdotal evidence of issues with children who should have been in school. Um, it's been mentioned on local radio stations and other areas. Have the police actually raised this issue with the Department? Thank you very much, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as an ex-teacher, you'll know that teachers will monitor their students, um, and particularly um, if they are working from home um, and providing work online. Um, the department is not aware of any concerns raised by the police um, at any time during that. Um, and you know, obviously the question was around free school meals for the groups sent home, but if the Honourable Member wishes to <laughs> raise any concerns with me, I'm happy to try and answer them. On to question 17, I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I beg to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture what the rationale was and how and why the decision was made to appoint pre-existing head teachers to the senior leadership roles in Williston and Skull and Jubilee Primary Schools, and if she will make a statement. Well, on the Chevet Shackens, e Sport and Culture, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture. Thank you, Mr President. Following the announcement of the appointments of new head teachers at Williston and School in Jubilee, who will both also retain their current positions, my department are aware of some of the concerns that have been raised. I'd like to take this opportunity to assure all honourable members that both head teachers are well qualified, experienced and innovative head teachers, and my department is confident that all schools will thrive under their leadership. The head teacher to multiple schools takes on a strategic delivery and is the accountable person for the school. This enables the deputy head teachers to take on operational delivery. The head teacher shall, in conjunction with the governing body of each school, be responsible for the policies and the strategic direction of all the schools. Whilst the head teacher will spend a proportionate amount of time in each school, depending on the needs and school contacts at any given time, each individual school shall retain their own deputy head teachers, teachers in charge. The deputy head teacher and teacher in charge shall be the operational head of the primary school in the absence of the head teacher at any time. I understand there has also been questions raised as to whether this is a cost-saving measure by my department. I can assure members that this is not the case. When advertising primary headship vacancies, candidates for both head of more than one school and head of one school will be considered, and the best candidate will be appointed based on the criteria <coughs> within the person's specification. Any savings is put back into the school's individual budgets, and it will be up to the head teacher of the said school to decide how to use this. In some cases, this may lead to additional staffing to support the school. The role of head teacher to more than one school allows heads to strengthen collaboration and communication between schools and also helps and supports encouragement of opportunities for professional development for staff. This type of role has already proven successful in a number of schools on the island. I'd like to take this opportunity to personally thank Mrs Burton and Mrs Adamson for their hard work, passion, determination and leadership over many years. I'd also like to wish, wish Mr Max Kelly and Mr Adrian Shorthouse the best of luck as they spend time getting to know their new schools in the coming months before taking up their positions on the 1st of January 2023. Thank you, Mr President. Yeah. Supplementary, Mr Ashford. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can I just start by echoing the Minister's words in tribute um, to the departing head teachers of the two schools, who I think have done an excellent job at both schools, um, and also, um, also thank Mr. Shorthouse for um, allowing me the time to speak with him um, early, um, early last week, and also Mr. Kelly, who will be meeting with me in two weeks' time. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to this, um, communication is always key. I've always supported the Department in their rationalisation of leadership roles, and particularly when it comes to smaller schools. But can I ask the Minister what consultation was held with parents of the school, and how was this communicated to parents? Because a lot of this seems to boil down to the fact it hasn't been communicated particularly well, and there's an awful lot of parents out there with fears that they're going to end up with a school that isn't... Um, hasn't got that leadership figure that it currently has and can I also ask the Minister was there any wider communication with employees of the department because I've also been contacted by current serving deputy head teachers <coughs> who aren't necessarily affected by this move but have actually felt v very have, have actually have actually felt that there hasn't been the wider engagement with those deputy, the deputy head population. For instance, there's one who's so disillusioned that contacted me and said they may even be looking now to move off Ireland for a position because they feel there isn't openings for them on Ireland. So can I ask what has been that wider engagement? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. And I'm pleased that the Honourable Member has had the opportunity to meet with one of the new head teachers and that he'll be meeting with the Williston head teacher um, in the next few weeks. Uh, the posts are always advertised, and um, obviously the, the Honourable Members mentioned that um, <coughs> deputies are feeling that they have no opportunity. The posts are always <coughs> advertised, and with regards to the communication aspect, obviously the head teachers that are taken on these roles from January are not in post till January. However, they are taking the opportunity to be in the school, meeting with the staff, and obviously will be communicating with parents as soon as they can. With regards to wider consultation on the appointment of head teachers, that's never been done and it isn't something that I would intend to do uh, at this time. Um, we've appointed two excellent head teachers in my view and I hope that the Honourable Member will see the benefits of some of the work that they've already achieved, in, particularly in, in the Williston head teacher, has achieved with Laxey and Dune. We also have this operation working in, in other schools in the island. We have it with Manor Park and Annika, which are challenging areas as well, and also um, Ramsey and Salby. So it isn't new, and I hope that once the Honourable Member has that opportunity to discuss with these new innovative head teachers, he will see the benefits and the work that they can bring for collaboration and staff development. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Uh, Guru Mahid, uh, Ector Annan, with your permission, because uh, I thought we were going to take these two questions together, 17 and 18, just covering a similar area, and if the Minister's happy with that, because my was about promotion for head teachers and opportunities, so it's a similar ground. Is that okay with you, I'm Mr. content to, to allow your question to be asked now, and we will open up uh, the, um, I guess, the chance for supplementaries on both areas. Uh, Maya, I too, like uh, the honourable member for uh, Douglas North, have had deputy head teachers not directly involved in this contact me, saying they feel uh, that this is a bit of a kick in the teeth for them. And also, I had had one that is now saying this does nothing for retention of school leaders, in fact quite the opposite, uh, it's making them consider looking further afield for job opportunities. The question is, uh, the Minister said, it's not a cost-cutting exercise. <coughs> so are the head teach, uh, deputy head teachers that are taking on more responsibility at the uh, two schools, including Williston, uh, being paid for that new responsibility? And uh, the very able uh, head teachers that are now multitasking around either two or three, have they had an uplift in salary as well? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, obviously, I'm not going to discuss individual contracts um, for um, the staff that have been appointed or for any of the deputies that may have chosen to go for the roles. I can say there was more than one applicant for both of the roles. Um, however, um, it's, it certainly wasn't a response that was 
inundated with applicants. Um, the most important thing, though, our deputies are appointed to the department's schools in a pay range, and, that can, and they can progress through that range within their roles. Should they wish to seek out more accelerated promotion pathways or they reach the top of their pay range, deputy head teachers have a number of promotion op options available to them. These include applying for a promoted post as advertised, which all of our posts are, such as a head teacher position through open recruitment. When a head teacher leaves, the advert is placed for the head teacher of that school, and applicants may include existing heads who wish to move schools, existing heads who wish to be considered as head of more than one school, and deputy head teachers who consider themselves ready for promotion to headship. Another option is to apply for a deputy headship of a different school, for example, one with a larger student role or with a specialist provision centre. There are other factors factors that may be considered in this type of move, such as different areas or a wider range of responsibilities. Should circumstances allow, there are sometimes options for secondments, for example, for a specific improvement project or to cover an absence in another school. And equally, as the experience of leadership which deputy head teachers have, it's transferable and they may choose to seek a leadership role in the Department of Education outside of schools. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Minister will appreciate there is some concern about increasing the federation of Judah Maxi primary schools with another more geographically distant primary school. And while I can appreciate having direct experience of Mr. Max Kelly, um, his talents in terms of leading a school, there is the um, expectation that this could become his leadership of the more thinly spread. Can the Minister indicate what the maximum um, number of schools would be the Department would see being permitted in a federation? Um, and in terms of the teacher in charge, is it that they become the de facto head teacher, and that a federated head is more of a strategic um, business leader doing the administration and <coughs> policy direction of a school. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for her questions. Um, there's, there's certainly no maximum, um, there's not a policy on the maximum of schools a head teacher can uh, apply for. However, the consideration would be down to the person's specification for the school, and um, obviously we take that into account to make sure we appoint the right person for the role. With regards to um, the vicinity of Dune and Laxey, obviously people um, feel you know they are close together, uh, and Williston perhaps um, is that little bit further away. The key piece of information I'd like to give honourable members and security today is, honourable member for Garth is correct, it is a more strategic role, and it is about making sure that our children get the best education throughout those three, we'll, we'll talk about the Laxey Dune in Williston, throughout those three schools, from a highly experienced qualified head teacher that will ensure that curriculum innovation and collaboration is for the best for his students. I'm quite confident of that, and that's why the department has chosen um, that particular head teacher, and obviously for school in Jubilee to combine QEG with um, school in Jubilee. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. Several questions in one. Um, can I ask the minister? Um, she, the minister keeps mentioning. <coughs> advertised can ask when those vacancies are advertised and for absolute clarity on the last two uh, two answers that the minister's given um, can she clarify is the minister saying that the two head teachers that have been appointed actually applied as part of this process to actually take on those schools or was it something that was driven by the department um, and can I also ask, uh, Mr. President, if it was something that was driven by the department, were, was it considered at any point that perhaps, um, that perhaps Williston and School End Jubilee share one head teacher, since they are geographically similar um, in terms of distance? Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, all of our posts are advertised on the government portal. And that's where um, any staff on Ireland, off Ireland, would, would apply for the positions. Both head teachers applied for the positions. 
And uh, with regards to the third question, obviously I'm not involved in any of the recruitment, but once I heard of the appointments, one of the first questions I said was, it's a shame that the schools closer together in Douglas were not party. However, they are both quite large schools anyway. Um, so it, it's not driven by the department at all. It's the individuals that applied um, to put themselves forward to be head of more than one school. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Good remind, Actor Anne. Uh, the Minister has mentioned that this isn't a cost-cutting exercise, both in media interviews and in here, uh, but has not provided us with any definition of how it's not a cost-cutting <laughs> Would you give a little bit more detail as to why she's able to say in here this is not a cost-cutting exercise? Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Obviously, the leader of school, head teacher, is on a specific salary point for the size of school. Um, when we appoint a head teacher of more than one school, they're already on a pay scale, and that will be reviewed for consideration of them taking on them, that additional numbers on roll. So, therefore, the salary of a full head teacher's salary, there will be savings within that, and it's down to that head teacher to decide what staff and arrangements and what he will use that money for. We will be still providing the same amount of money to Williston School and also to school in Jubilee. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you very much. Um, quite concerning that the cost is being absorbed by the schools. In terms of additional costs within the staffing structure, how many members of staff have been affected by this change and what will the additional costs be of those staff taking on the additional responsibility? I know the department's getting the schools to absorb the cost, but there must be some recognition there is an extra cost to upgrade the existing teachers to carry out additional roles. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. And it's up to the head teachers of these schools to decide what their staff and structure is, what they need to provide um, the education and um, services to, to, the, to their community, which is the students. Um, with regards to cuts, they will have to balance their budget. So I'll take a figure, for instance, if it's, say, £40,000, they will use that money to either pay additional staff to do extra responsibilities or they can decide that they might get additional support staff in to support some of the schools. It depends what the head teacher wishes to do with the budget. That's the point of a strategic role, is to manage the finances and the structures of the school. Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President. I beg leave to um, ask the Minister about the relative responsibilities of the Department and the head teachers in all of this. And I suppose the other question behind that is to what extent does the Department micromanage head teachers? Minister, to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank the Honourable Member for, for the question. Um, clearly, um, it's not for the Department to micromanage head teachers, as it's for us to ensure that we have the quality assurance and performance out of our schools, and the head teacher has the responsibility to manage their individual schools, and we will hold them to account on budget and performance. Thank you, Mr. President. I imagine Mr. Wallenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Minister has mentioned the shared leadership model has been successful. What is the measurement of that success, and how do the children benefit from that directly, bearing in mind that the last two years have been emotionally draining for them? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, w one of the measures of success which I've found out about by just doing some research with regards to these two head teachers is they've both been put forward for national awards um, because of the work that they're doing with collaboration and how in innovative it is. What we will do as a department is obviously we get results. Um, we've recently, our results are in our departmental plan and that includes primary um, results as well. So obviously when they take up post in January, next year's results will be an indicator as to how well it's working. But I think the well-being of our students and ensuring that they are in school being educated, and I'm sure in your community you will hear from your parents, and I welcome people to contribute and let us know if there is any concerns, but it's about getting children the best education, right staff and structures in front of them to deliver the education they deserve. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the Minister 
confirm that she believes there will be no detriment to any crime school that is included in a federation? Um, and also, looking to the future, is this the model that we could expect to see across more of our primary schools? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said, this will be the fourth um, collaboration of, of schools uh, with regards to um, a head teacher of more than one school. Um, with regards to any detriment, we've certainly not seen any evidence of that in the, in the schools that have been operating it. In fact, we've seen um, great improvements. Um, uh, obviously, that is something we do need to monitor, but I would not expect it. I will hope to see that these schools will thrive and we'll see great improvements and support for everybody within them. Final supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr President. And a few questions in one, if I, if I may, Mr President. Um, very, um, can I ask the Minister, and she may not have this information to hand, but if not, can she circulate it, how many applicants were there for each of the positions? Um, and the, take, I want to take the Minister back to one of her original answers where she mentioned, um, and it was probably because I used the word, and it's probably not the right word, about consultation with parents. Um, it's about informing parents what's going on, Mr President, and would the Minister agree that it's important that parents understand what is going on and what the potential impacts are. And would the minister agree with me that that still needs to be done? Because as far as I'm aware, um, and I'm still getting contacted by parents in Williston who don't know how this is going to work in practice, and parents want reassurance. So will the minister commit that there will be engagement with parents around how this is actually going to work in practice? And the minister also mentioned in one of her earlier answers, Mr. President, about there being no policy in place about a maximum number of schools that someone can take on. Would the Minister agree with me that if we're going to keep going down this route, and this is going to be the future, um, then perhaps there needs to be, rather than it simply being subjective every time a vacancy comes up? Minister to reply. Thank you. Uh Mr. President, um, I, I'm happy to take on board the Honourable Member's comments with regards to consultation um, with parents and families from, from the school. Obviously, there's still a head teacher in post um, up until that time, and I would expect the new head teachers to make sure that they are communicating with their families and parents and give them some indication of how they will operate their schools, because you know, they may have different leadership styles than the current head teacher, but it will be up to them to make sure they communicate that. But I'm happy to take that, that on board. Um, and, and with, with regards to the policy, as I said, there isn't a current policy, um, but obviously our, our departmental report will be debated next month. Um, do, do we, are we looking at every policy? Yes, we are. Are we looking at the best ways to make sure our children have teachers, qualified head teachers, professionals in front of them? Yes, we are. Are we short of applicants for some of these posts? Yes, we are. And I can, you know, we had two applicants for Williston and three for school and Jubilee. So I think that gives you an indication of the people that were applying for these positions anyway. But I'm confident that these schools will thrive under these two head teachers. On to question 19, call on the Honourable Member for Aaron Michael, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Mr President. If I may ask the Chair of the Post Office what is being done to recruit a sub postmaster for Kurt Michael. Colonel Karlak Ek Postek Ellen Vannon, Chair of the Isle of Man Post Office, to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm pleased to announce that expressions of interest are being invited on the Isle of Man Government portal from this week. Uh, supplementary, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, given that the existing incumbent gave notice this May that they intended to retire at the end of the year, and given the 2019 Timwald approved strategy for the post office to develop a financially and socially responsible demand-driven service network, why is an expression of interest only being looked at now with 10 weeks or so left? <coughs> Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my understanding is that there was some uncertainty about agency services that the post office is being asked to provide going forward. Uh, including my card, vehicle licensing and issues like that and therefore didn't feel to be in a position to talk to people about taking over that sub post office uh, but it's now been, uh, there is more clarity and uh, it, therefore it seems to be a, a perfect time to look for expressions of interest. 
We move on to question 20. I'll call on the Honourable Member for Douglas South, Mrs Christian. P apologies. I do apologise. You did ask for a supplementary, Mr Johnson. Please uh, do ask that on question 19. Thank you. Um, can I thank the Chair for his, his response? The prior information notice, which will seek expressions of interest from interested parties, only looks to provide services in Cape Michael until the 30th of June next year, so only for six months after the retirement of the incumbent postmistress. Can the Chair explain the reason behind this and how this will in any way attract a new uh, provider? Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Isle of Man Post Office Board is seeking to understand interest in providing services for a short period of time, as the Honourable Gentleman says, until June next year, for counter service, parcel collection and or the hosting of a kiosk, while we work to ensure the long-term certainty for services in the community. Once we understand the interest in services an individual may wish to provide, we can progress with the interim procurement as appropriate. Thank you, sir. Final supplementary, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Mr President. If I can put to the Chair, doesn't it show a lack of confidence in the Post Office's own vision to provide and enhance services in communities like Kurt Michael to be waiting for a steer on vehicle licences, my cars, etc., before a commitment to a vital community service is made? <coughs> Chair to reply. Uh, I think we've got to be careful here, sir, to, to um, differentiate between what are social services and what is a commercial operation. And one of the, uh, the commandments from Tim Wald via the Council of Ministers to the Post Office is to operate as a commercial concern. And uh, one of the others is that it makes a profit or seeks to make a profit. And all these services in a declining <coughs> market are at sometimes marginal. So the Post Office has to bear that in mind. It isn't necessarily a, a, a lack of confidence because the Post Office model is changing on a regular basis as well and is looking for new opportunities. Uh, I, I do take the, the Honourable Gentleman's point, uh, but I think that the Post Office is acting in a responsible way uh, rather than uh, anything else. Sir. On to question 20. Call on the Honourable Member for Douglas South, Mrs Christian. Thank you. Mr President, um, I'd like to ask the Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority what the potential risks to, to the island are of possible natural gas shortages reported by Ofgem. Thank you, Mr President. Well, on the call, on Shavashan Vernon, Chair of the Manx Utilities Authority, to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, the war in Ukraine has created huge volatility and uncertainty in energy markets across Europe. I would firstly like to reassure members and <coughs> customers that, that we do not expect that energy supplies to the Isle of Man will be restricted over the coming winter period or have significant impact for the Isle of Man. Manx Utilities imports natural gas for the Isle of Man both for the generation of electricity and on behalf of Manx Gas. The National Grid in the United Kingdom has published its usual winter outlook and its view remains that there will be adequate supply margins for this coming winter. That is, there will not be a shortage of natural gas supplies. Banks Utilities also remains in regular contact with its energy suppliers and therefore it is confident that there is sufficient resilience in their supply chains to maintain reliable energy, energy supplies this winter. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Christian. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, Ofgem did report that they, uh, they were concerned about quarter one in 2023, if particularly um, there was going to be a cold winter. The, would the Chair like to comment on that, please? Thank you, Mr President. Chair to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Certainly, I think looking at the consequences, potential consequences, rather than the likelihood of a, of a, of a shortage, um, the issue recently reported in the media and being referred to by this question relates to the Balancing and Settlement Code panel's recommendation. The Balancing Settlement Code sets out how the GB electricity market operates and any party may request changes to the code to address issues they are concerned by. Requested changes follow a published process and include a fast-tracking option, which has been requested in this case. The code modification proposal is, is titled Mitigating Gas Supply Emergency Risks, and the trigger for it was the potential for very high financial charges that would fall on electricity-generating companies who use natural gas to generate electricity in the UK in the event that their gas supplies were restricted and they could not meet their electricity supply obligations, which is a bit of a complicated 
I think it simplifies to say that the, some of the power companies in the UK, the gas, huge gas for generating electricity, will be, will be fined quite severely if they do not supply electricity to their customers. And when there is a risk of uh, gas supply or concern of that, they want to make sure that uh, those, those uh, fines are removed because it wouldn't be fair. And I think that's, that's basically where, where the situation arises. Thank you. Final supplementary, Mrs. Christian. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, I, and I, I'm glad you've mentioned about those charges, actually, um, Chair, because um, you know, that could actually bring risks of insolvency for some of those businesses. So, again, I mean, what I'm concerned of is what are the other contingency plans that the MUA has thought about um, should this occur? It's not saying it will occur, but what are the contingency plans in the event that it does? It would be practical to have these contingency plans. If you could elaborate more on that. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we need to separate gas supply from the, from the companies. So obviously, we have, a, we have a public system in the UK or private businesses. Some have already gone out of business. We know that. The important thing is a national grid and the understanding that we as the, as the MUA have a full understanding of what's going on on a daily basis within that national grid. We also need to remember that we have a three-tier system, so not just gas, we also have our interconnector and we have our diesel generators as well. So we're very confident that um, whatever happens over the coming winter and there is uncertainty that uh, our supplies will be secure.